Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay and welcome to episode 22. I'm interviewing Tobin Kirk, the executive producer for Blind Design Agency in Santa Monica, California. And we get into everything, it's crazy, let's start. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hey everyone, so I'm interviewing Tobin Kirk, who is an executive producer for Blind. Blind does amazing work. I'm a really big fan of the stuff that they do. Uh, we touch base on so much stuff in this episode. We have a little bit too much rum, I think. Um, we were drinking uh, Ron Zacapa Centario Exo Special Edition, 25-year-old. Beautiful stuff. But uh, yeah, we get a little... <laughs> A little bit tipsy towards the end, but honestly, this has got to be such an insightful episode because Tobin is someone who has so much experience and coming from the production side where typically we talk from artists who've worked in the industry, a lot of different people, but never from the perspective of a producer or an exec producer or an EP. Uh, so I think that this is really great. Me personally, I think that there's so much insight from uh, talking about hiring artists through to working on big productions. I mean, Tobin's worked on everything from Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, uh, Coldplay music videos, a lot of different stuff. And just the stuff that we get onto, the advice that he gives, uh, the insight that he shares, uh, I would personally pay to be a fly on the wall in this conversation. I think that there is so much valuable insight that I personally am going to be taking a lot of notes. Uh, and I think that a lot of you can benefit from this too. So I won't hype this up. I'm just going to say that this is a really, really insightful and awesome episode. So let's get in there and get your pen ready. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hi everyone. This is Alan McKay. I'm here with Tobin Kirk, who's an exec producer at Blind, and he's done an assortment of stuff. I'm just going to let you give a bit of an intro because I think you know yourself better than I do. Cool. Thanks for having me, Alan. I appreciate it. Well, right now I'm the executive producer at Blind. I've been there for four years. I actually started as uh, as a producer there. I started as a freelance producer, actually, um, and then I got hired on full time. And then when the the former executive producer uh, moved on, Chris asked me to take over the executive producer position, and I told him no. So, uh, well, here it is. You know, two and a <laughs> half years later, and uh, and uh, I'm still going strong. It's a it's been a bit of a transition for me to move from the production side of things to the executive producer side. Um, But a really cool opportunity to learn a lot and a lot of growth for me. And I mean, we'll get back to that because I actually want to pick your brain a lot about a lot of that stuff. But I don't know, I mean, initially, I'd love to get your background because this is one of those moments where I've known you for five plus years. No, 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 no. it's way longer than that. I I think it was 2009, October 2009. So my math is correct. During my burnout period. But but yeah, I mean... Well, I've got some stories about Alan. Oh, yeah. Everyone does, God damn it. But um, I mean, how did you get started out? I mean, in the beginning, before you kind of transitioned into producer world. Right. Well, the, my kind of background was is that I, um, you know, I grew up in the Inland Empire. I grew up in Claremont, which is east of L.A. And I had, um, I, I, you know, my brother would make Super 8 movies when I was a kid. So we were always making Super 8 movies and such. My dad actually um, ran the Interface Sorry, the Interfaith Media Center, which was a, a media center on campus of a, of a um, religious college where people could go and film stuff. So we always had cameras around. Um, my dad would videotape Christmas and stuff. I'm going pretty deep. So That's but fine. when skateboarding, I used to do a lot of skating back in the, in the uh, mid and, and late 90, 80s. And um, I just, you know, there, we always had a camera around, so my friends would have me videotape themselves. Now I know why you want that skateboard. You're yeah, about. exactly. <laughs> so I, um, so anyways, I just used to skate. I used to do that all the time, and then I, I went to school initially for illustration, and I figured out that I couldn't draw, so mm-hmm. that's a bad, bad uh, major for me. But then I slowly started just getting pulled into filmmaking, and I didn't really think of it as a career, just because it was something that I had kind of always kind of dabbled in. And I was like, wow, I could actually you know, do this for, for a living. 
So I went to film school and I graduated from film school. I uh, stayed in San Jose, which is where I went to school for longer than I should have. Mm-hmm. Um, met my wife and actually moved down to, to Los Angeles. And, you know, it's weird because you have your, you know, your, your film degree and you're all you're going to be a director and you're going to take on the town. And then that was a PA for a while, <laughs> uh, which is actually tr- traditional route. Yeah, exactly. Working my way up. Uh, but, you know, there was something fun to that because you learn a lot. Um, of what what to do and what not to do and mm-hmm. it's kind of fun you know going on runs and you know I remember once I got to take a script to uh, Uma Thurman's house awesome. that was a, yeah that was a big deal she wasn't there uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you, you came back with like your own story it's like yeah, oh, exactly. yeah. oh yeah I made it totally <laughs> I, I remember I like I had like you know binoc and I'm all ah, I got my you know <laughs> fix my hair open up the doors to her assistant she's all thanks close the door um, but I remember that one was job awesome. yeah that was the best <laughs> Take a selfie. But I remember once I, I worked on the, that was on this film called The Truth About Cats and Dogs. Oh yeah. And I, uh, I, I remember once Uma Thurman was sick for a couple of days, so there was this actor named Mike Ben Chapman, and he's gone on to do a lot more work. But they put him up at this hotel by the Magic Castle, mm-hmm. and my job every day was to bring him over uh, his per diem of nine hundred bucks cash. And I did this for like for a long time because it was not a bad day, right? Yeah, yeah. For, for doing nothing. Yeah, exactly. I took my percentage. But so here's this dude that's been sitting around the house all day, you know, probably you know just drinking or smoking pot and stuff. But he's you know then some guy shows up with um, you know some kid shows up with nine hundred dollars cash. Mm-hmm. I'm his best friend, so he'd invite me in. We'd hang out for a little while, play awesome. video games or whatever. Um, and then I'd be like, oh yeah, the traffic was really, really <laughs> rough on the way back. It was, it was tough. So you, you maybe go get him lunch or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In Burbank, he, he's a, he's <laughs> what a prima donna that guy is. Yeah, what an asshole. So um, beat but, his high score. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> posted that on Facebook. I, um, but then after that, yeah, I got the the really big break for me was. Um, you know, I, I started moving up in the ranks. I started being a production coordinator and a production manager. And then the, 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 my big break and, the, and probably my most exciting career move, other than working at Blind, was I worked for a video and film artist named Bill Viola uh, in Long Beach. And if you're not familiar with his work, he does, he does um, video installation. He uses, he's a fine artist. He just uses video and film as his medium. And so we did, um, we did installations for... I mean, the Guggenheim Museum in Berlin, Germany, um, uh, a gallery in, in um, England. We did, uh, we did a show at the, uh, the Getty Museum, and we, did a, uh, we partnered with Peter Sellers, the, the director, um, wow. on an opera for, uh, for Tristan and Isolde at the, um, at the, uh, uh, the Getty or the thing is downtown. And so, I mean, it's just amazing opportunities. And so when you go to film school, you're like, oh, film is an art. And it really, I feel like it is. Mm. And this gave me an opportunity to really show film as, and, and, and work with film as an art form, like an actual art that would go up on a wall in a museum. Yep. Yeah, which we rarely get to mm. actually do that kind of stuff. Exactly. So that's, that's yeah, great. But, but every, I mean, I think that there is art in every project that you work on and you have to find that art or you're just going to be going through it. I remember a long time ago I read an uh, article from a director and I wish I could remember who it was but it was like he was talking about how when you act with another actress or an actor you, you, you don't pretend that they're your girlfriend. You actually find something in them that you love. Mm-hmm. And then you, then it's like the feeling that comes across is genuine love because you actually love that person. You're not like, oh, that's my wife, just with a different face. So, um, so let me just interrupt for yeah, a second, sir. and I'm just gonna say that like that we've whenever, been drinking whenever, heavily. Whenever yeah. actors and actresses say like, oh yeah, like you know, it's just a fake screen kiss. My boyfriend doesn't mind. Mm-hmm. It's like deep down, it's like no, we just fell in love with each other at that one moment. Yeah, and yeah. The the awkward uh, partners on the side going, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you just gotta let it happen. So, yeah. but. So I think that's that's an important thing for for anybody, whether they're a producer or a production coordinator or an artist. You know, they've got to find something that they love in each particular project, or you're just going to burn out. I mean, when you yeah. do, you know, a cat commercial and then a vacuum commercial, we were talking earlier about that. <laughs> it's like you just you're just like, oh, this is horrible. And I think that's one of the reasons that Blind's so successful, is that we sprinkle in these super creative music videos throughout the year, and I think that keeps the the creative juice is really flowing with, mm-hmm. with everybody and the excitement level going. And even when you are doing like a Hoover commercial or whatever, whatever it's going to be, <laughs> to explain what we're doing right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, um, probably should. 
but but um no i mean like even when you are doing that stuff and that's i think that over time i don't want to glorify like oh when you get more experience you actually care about the small things but like you know initially when i started out i might like look at a logo job and be like i don't have any passion or care about this but over time you know i would look at anything and be like all right well i'm gonna make this the best it can be and yeah yeah it doesn't need to be i mean maybe it's more because you don't need to prove yourself so constantly it's like i gotta be doing the next big rambo or whatever it's gonna be but like you know i can work on i mean i had a meeting yesterday to work on a very probably in my opinion the biggest movie of next year Mm -hmm. um however because it'll be initially in pre-production I, you know, the stuff I initially will do will not be seen in the film. And then if I choose to come back at the end of the film, that's when I get to do the big stuff. So right. the thing is, that whether it's that or whether it's something else, like you can go into a production and appreciate the the story. And actually, I, I was listening to a podcast this morning about entrepreneurs and like for them, you know, it, it's not about the result because as soon as you get that result, you're already on to the next thing. And yeah, it's more yeah. about the journey. And I do agree or I do believe that because you know, it's more about, okay, you find a team, you find a process and you go and you do it and Mm -hmm. you try and make it so seamless and perfect. And even if to some person, you know, you're doing a tea kettle commercial, whatever it's going to be, you can still find the challenge of making that thing so fucking extraordinary within it. And I do think that that's where it can become quite fun is just the fact that you can take pride in what you do. It doesn't need to be something that you're like, okay, is this going to impress the chicks when I mention it at the bar yeah. at 5 p.m.? Which is important, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So for me and you, I'm sure, like you, you you take on any project the same way. It's going to be a big deal and you want to give it everything you can. And you have to, or you're going to burn out. You know, yeah. you might as well just go and work at a, at a tea kettle factory, you know? Don't knock it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, and again, like, I've known you for a very long time, but at the same time, I guess I've known you more as a friend, so I don't really kind of look into like, oh, you've worked on this and this this is your past and everything else. Yeah. I, okay, I'm just going to explain this. <laughs> you, you should say it because... Like, no, you, you tell it. You were saying that okay. at Blind... Okay, go ahead. No, I'll tell. Yeah, so at Blind, before we do a call, we kind of stand up and we raise our arms above our heads in kind of a victory pose and we put them on our, on our waist like a Wonder, Woman. Wonder Woman. And it just kind of gets the blood <laughs> flowing, but more than anything else, it puts you in a state where you're, you're celebrating victory. You know, when people run across the, the finish line, they raise their arms naturally, you know? It's, it's not something they plan. Like, oh, when I run across the, the, the finish line, I'm gonna raise up my I'm arms and V. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, good, good job. For the photo, yeah, I'm gonna pat myself on the back. They raise their arms, like, fuck yes. So, uh, we just do that before. It, it changes the, the, you know, the chemistry in the brain before you get on a call, and it makes you feel kind of victorious when you go into it, and you're ready to kind of present yourself as an expert, and that's what we do, so. Even if you get winded or anything else, like opening up your lungs, it's good for you. Yeah. And being bigger than you are, like, yeah. you look at, like, a, the, I like the example of the frilly neck lizard, if you know what that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you think of Jurassic Park, same thing with yeah. that venom thing, it kills a yeah. human. Um, <laughs> but, no man. <laughs> um, but that, that, I actually, I like, got an analogy with him where he always talks about, like, why do uh, postmen go crazy? It's because the mail keeps coming, coming, and coming. And I'm like, I've had that insanity yeah, with email yeah. over the past few months. But, <laughs> um, but you do with that, where it's like, okay, you, you want to be larger than you are. Yeah. Like, you, most people, I guess, kind of avoid the kooky kind of stuff. Like, oh, yeah, if you think positive thoughts, you're going to yeah. get that. And I actually, I'm going to, boy, I'm going to totally go on a segue into something. A little tangent. Okay, go. I'm ready. I'm but, following um, no, I was sitting in a car with, uh, actually, I had him on my podcast, Carlos and Guiano, a good buddy of mine, used to work at, it was while we were at ILM, and we're sitting in a car together, and we're having this like, deep moment where I'm like tell, telling him, you know, like, what would you want to do for a living, like, if you could do anything you want, because right. he can be, or at least he used to be the jaded, most jaded person in the freaking world, <laughs> so like, I'm like, look, if you could do anything you want, what would you want to be? And he was very into shooting at the time, so he's like, if... If I could just be a grandmaster shooter, like a gun, I, you mean? Yeah, like okay. doing target, like target shooting, competitive shooting. Sure, sure. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as a grandmaster <laughs> shooter, but um, he said, like, you know, if I could be a grandmaster shooter, I would be content in my life. I would be happy. Right. And I told him, like, well, why don't you do that? Like, yeah. fuck what you do. I like, go and do that thing. And like, yeah. the cool thing was, like, that was more. He explained the process, and it's like a ten plus year process. And I asked him like two years after that, like, you know, so your grandmaster shooter yet? And he's like, he's like, I'm a master shooter. Wow. And, so he's, he, and he was going like nice. that year for that goal. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I'm like, that's fucking awesome. And it's more about like eliminating 
the distractions that are holding you back. But like he, we got onto the subject of the secret, which you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, he, he mentioned that. And like I, I guess based on some of the stuff we talked about earlier, where I'm always gonna, and even at lunch the other day, like I'm always gonna look at things subjectively and see what I can take from it. Right. And so like he mentioned, that, like oh, what bullshit, the, the the secret. You know, you think positive thoughts, and then it comes to you. Yeah. Like, and I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I think it's, I don't agree with, uh, sure. cause I've had, and this is the flip side. I've had people who, and this is an example in the secret, you drive along around a parking structure and you're like, ah, I want a parking spot. And yeah. then it, it magically appears and then you're like, yeah, secret. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for me, I'm like, well, in a way like that can be a good practice. Like if you think about it, it's actually a, a really good practice to have where it's like, I'm going to decide what I want, what my priorities are. Yeah. And I'm going to concentrate on making those my goal. Yeah. And if I focus on it long enough and I work at it, then it's going to fucking come true. Yeah. And I don't think you put it, I mean, you put it out in the universe. It's not like you put it on the universe yeah. and you go sit on the couch. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Done. You put it by putting it out in the universe, you're thinking in the meantime, like, well, what could I do to achieve exactly. that goal? And you just, and you're, and, or if anything, you're just more open to what might come mm-hmm. to, to help that be versus like, Oh, I'll just blow that thing off. That might, you know, yep. that might get me in that goal. So yeah, yeah I, there's something to be said for it. And I think, you know, Chris Doe, who's the owner of blind and, and ECD, he's, he's really into that kind of, I mean, it's not the hokey, you know, um, Tony Robbins sort of stuff. Well, I, I'm going to defend Tony. Yeah, no, actually I will too. Cause I, I actually did a project with him. That guy is Amazing. He is a masterpiece. Yep. But anyway, Chris is into that sort of thing, and just like mm-hmm. that power of positive thinking and excitement, and and and, and, it, and it's infectious. You know, it spreads throughout the studio for sure. It's good. Yeah. I, I, later, I want to pick your brain about Chris because um, I think Chris, like Christo, is the founder of Blind, and he's just a brilliant guy. He's a brilliant mm-hmm. creative designer. Like yes. you see him in design books everywhere. Is like you know. One of the man, and he is like he's real, he's a quiet guy, and but he's pretty inspirational. And um, yeah, well, we'll have to get you, he'll come in here someday if you want. He'll, I'd love that, actually. yeah. Right. Like, see, put out in the universe, yeah, there you go. But I mean, actually, just as we taper off of that, but like, I think one of the biggest hurdles most people have is actually prioritizing what they really want, yeah. And it's the same thing with like, what do you want to do when you're freaking out your career in the beginning, yeah. Right. Which is why most people do psychology. Um, they, you know, at university, they, um, yeah, they need to figure out like what they want to be, and most people don't know, and they just kind of go with the flow. And yeah, and then they just go from one thing to the next, and then the next, and they yeah. never take the time to kind of think about it and like, what's the direction I really want to go? I, I always say like, you know, you shouldn't like because everyone has that, um, you know, oh, that was an opportunity of your lifetime, you yeah. know, and I hate that expression because I think that successful people are the ones who create opportunities, yeah, and agreed. that is more about like, you know there isn't like once in a lifetime you get them all the time it's just whether or not you pick them up like my girlfriend her current job we we're talking about earlier like she the way she got that job and i didn't actually think about it at the time but basically her employers were all like they read through the emails that she'd been sending and later on they were like you know those emails that you sent were were fucking brilliant like i've never ever seen that before and blah 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 and she's like oh my boyfriend helped me write all those and <laughs> but what it came down to was basically she had emailed like legitimately emailed them just to ask a few questions because she really loved this um this industry she wanted to get into and she just said like i really want to get in this industry i got questions about it blah 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 and like so they they came back and said like well it's funny because we're actually looking for like i'm about to put out a post right now for designers blah 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 and she's emailing him back and I heard her say that I'm like why don't you email him yeah. and say and so she's like okay I want to email and say you know can I can I put in an application and I'm like no f- fuck the application say here's my work and you know maybe if you're interested I I want that position maybe you don't need to put out a, an advertisement after all and yes. so they looked save at it the, save them the trouble but but that's just it like you rather than be like okay and this was her philosophy was after I pointed out can I put my application in it's like no 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 like boycott the application yeah. and yeah. go for the kill and she did and then you know a few more emails and she got the job and so the thing is they started looking at it afterwards like wow like I see what you did there. You just completely eliminated there of it being any competition. And that's what I've always said about going through the side door. You don't go and line up with everyone else at the front of the resume. You come through the side door and no one is ever going to, you know, there's no competition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That kind of actually brings me to back to, to blind is I, I'd seen a music video that, uh, that blind had done a long time ago. Vanessa, one of their creative directors did a, a music video for lilac wine. 
And if you have a chance, check it out because it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And I remember seeing it and it was so amazing. And and I was just blown away. Actually, so later that day, I sent a resume to Blind. And, you know, I'm sure it landed in their inbox, you know, with 40 others and just got ignored. So, mm-hmm. you know, well, yeah, so it wasn't until, you know, years later that I was actually working there that I talked to the head of production and just said, yeah, you know, I just want to let you know, I sent you a resume, mm-hmm. you know, a long time ago. And, uh, and she's like, oh, yeah, I probably threw it away. So, yeah, <laughs> go in the back door. Yeah, now you're the boss. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, no, that's good. I mean, and I like those stories, too, where because I always think persistence is a really key thing. Yeah. And, you know, you, you shouldn't be like, all right, well, they don't want me. You know, yeah. actually, you know, not to go off topic, but I will say, like, there's a lot of people, and this, uh, this actually applies to everything. A lot of people will, um, you know, they hold off applying for a job. They hold off doing their dream thing that they want to do because they want to get it all perfect. And yeah, I think nice. the number one thing is just to get off your ass and do it. Yeah. And I actually was online the other day trying to find the Nike, like a good Nike slogan. I'm like, I'm selling out, but I want a fucking just do it to yeah. put on my wall. Because uh, when it comes to that, like, you know, they, they could be like, okay, well, I'm going to wait till like my resume, everything I've got is like all in place. And yeah, I've got yeah. everything I need then I can apply. It's like, well, you don't know. Like, You could be shooting out some stuff right now. You send out your resume. They say, well, usually we wouldn't have included you. However, you just contacted us at the right time yeah, and we yeah. needed that. And like, So many of the, that, that is the one thing. It's hard because you, you want to be persistent, but you don't want to be a pest. But I think a lot of it is just timing. And there's mm, not necessarily a way to exactly. know the timing. I mean, for us, you know, we reach out to companies, um, you know, prior to you know, like three or four months prior to the CES because we know that they're going to need to create a mm-hmm. video to go it's like there. Super Bowl, so, right? Yeah, exactly. Same sort of thing. So, so that's something you can calculate. A lot of the time it's just, you just happen to be at the right place in the right time. And, and, and unfortunately there's nothing you can do to do that other than just make yourself open and available, to, you know, put it out in the universe. Got to be in it to win it, right? Yeah. So. As yeah, Chip Douglas, that's right. Well, at, at 13, like, um, I just remember having stupid conversations, like being a thirteen-year-old kid. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, just remember, he who procrastinates masturbates, and that always like stuck with me in in a stupid way, but later resonated with me of like, and I've used this like mentioned guys and girls. I'm not ashamed to say like it's such a dumb line, but it actually is so true. It's like he who procrastinates masturbates is. It's like if you you got to be in to win it. You if you're not going to jump in there, then you're going to be left alone. Totally. It's just like you know, perfection is the enemy of good. Um, I, can't, I think that's Confucius, but it, I actually had never heard that till oh, really? till yesterday. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, we used to have that up on the wall at Blind because it was one of those things. Because if you if if you wait for something to be perfect, it's never going to be. And it's not saying it just you you know you give them half-assed work, but it's just like done is better than than not done. In fact, I didn't hear that. I actually heard one that was quite one ups that it was um, the enemy of excellence is good Mm. and it was more to do with the fact that people will be afraid of of excellence and they'll settle for good and we all go through that i mean like anytime i go to do something big i'm like fuck am i gonna fail am i gonna you know i'm gonna come out like embarrassing myself here and like we all have that and so you cower back into uh into your safety net and i've done that like i remember the first time i ever like broke from uh, a staff job as like a senior technical director to become a um, to be go to go freelance. Yeah. And like instantly, I'm like, I'm gonna starve to death. I'm gonna become homeless. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna fail. And then you get out there, and it's like, fuck. That was you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and I haven't looked back. But you have those things. It's like I'm gonna, and I see it all the time. I see people who their spirit breaks at that one moment where they're like, I'm gonna do something great. And when you talk about that aha moment or that, you know, that moment that one in a lifetime moment it, okay. it is when they say i'm gonna do this and then they're like no i'm gonna i'm gonna go back and cower in my cave and yeah, build yeah. what's safe but i think there is yeah and what's safe it's like i it you were talking about movie quotes earlier it's that whole you know you just gotta shit your pants and just dive right in that's a uh from reservoir dogs and it's like it's this, it's the thing i mean what you, you're when i was trying to progress in my career from a coordinator to a production manager there's never a point where you're like okay i'm ready to be a coordinator now you have to just be like i'm a i'm a production manager mm-hmm. and i won't take any more coordinator jobs and you're gonna mm-hmm. you know have a couple months off and then you just and you just have to live you just have to sink and sink or swim you just go and you push yourself to learn and you do it and then you do your production manager for a while then you're a then you're a, a producer and mm-hmm. you don't take the 
production manager jobs and you know people call you and you want to take the jobs and you just you just don't do it you just can't you know or you're just going to stay in that same and that's fine for some people you know that want to just do that over and over again but i think in a in a industry like this you got to keep climbing up, yep. you you're know? Be aggressive or at least some people you know um that's actually a really good point about like reinventing yourself because like yeah. the only way to kind of move up the ladder especially if you are like i, I always believe in like fast tracking your career and you got to be aggressive yeah. you yep. got to be strategic and we kind of talked about this beforehand about like what frustrates me about people tend to just kind of be cattle and expect, okay, like if I just pay my dues, yeah. I'm going to move up the ladder. People yeah. are going to identify what I'm doing. And that's bullshit. Especially like, millennials too. They just think, and, and, and we could do a whole a podcast on wanna... that. But I'm just saying <laughs> a lot of them will just be like, okay, listen, I, you know, I've done an okay job at my job. I'm ready for a promotion. And it's like, well, well you're not going to get a promotion mm-hmm. unless you do an excellent job at your job. And then yeah. you get along. And they just want to be promoted for no reason. Where did I hear this? This is a long time ago, but um, to, to deserve a promotion – you should be able to do your job 100% and your boss's job 50%. Yeah, that's nice. I like that. And a lot of the times, you know, you'll have to not never work at a place again. And I know that's weird, but I know that, you know, people get used to you if you go in and you're a, I don't know, if you're a junior, you d- yeah, you're a junior, junior something, J- yeah. yeah, you're junior artist. You're always going to be known as a junior artist. And that mm-hmm. goes for your rate, too. Your rate, yep. what, well, that rate that you go in with is going to be your rate forever. I don't care who you are. And that's, uh, anyway, so I'll go off on that later. But I think that, you know, sometimes you have to work and then you just go and work at someplace else and you're mm-hmm. not a junior artist anymore. And then that other place will call. You're just going to have to say no because they're going to want to hire you as a junior artist and they're going to want to pay you as a junior artist. You can go back there later, but you like, I read this um, dating book years ago. Actually, no, it wasn't a dating book. It was something else, but basically it wasn't. It was a dating book. No, it wasn't. I, I got no problem with that. But like, um, but no, it was a book essentially about relationships. And I, I do think dating and business is the same in mm-hmm. every single way. But um, essentially it's about like if you want to change how the perspective people see you as, you need to go away for a while and come yeah, back. Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of resets the, the status quo. And like if – and I've, I've said this before, but like I really strongly believe in, in – fast tracking your career and the easiest way to do that is you go somewhere you get you know you do your digs you get your um your stuff going but then you leave yeah and you go somewhere else because if you go there it's four, four years later you're going to be a mid-level like if we're talking about artists you're going to be a mid-level artist yeah. or if you're a production coordinator you know or client service production coordinator production manager right, producer right, right. junior producer first um it's a long fucking way and the yeah. thing is you learn your shit and then you go somewhere else you renegotiate your salary renegotiate Mm -hmm. uh your status everything about it and you keep doing that constantly yeah and the thing is like i remember being a junior at um at the second biggest studio in australia and i was there and i had friends of mine guys from warner brothers who were talking with like the head of production like why the hell is alan like i was getting 500 dollars a week at the time and um and the thing is i was doing like it was a dream team of artists there, but I was doing, like, I was the effects department. And, yeah, you know, they were all arguing, like, why is Alan being paid this money? And they're like, well, he's a he's a junior, so he's got to, you know, pay his dues, yeah. which I do believe you need to. And I sure. need so many fucking people who are like, they, their second job, they're like, I need the world. And yeah. it, it's just like, dude, you need to pay your dues. Yeah. But the thing is, I remember leaving, going away for two or three years, coming back. From being the junior to being uh, like a lead right. and earning three, four times that, you yeah. know. And the thing is, if I had stayed there the whole time, like it wouldn't have mattered. You would have exponentially gone up, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and 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 slightly off subject, but it's the same sort of thing when a client handle, you know, hires us uh, to do a project. You know, if you come in at a lower rate. Um, There's not much. All right, well, it's it's like I'm giving you a microscopic bit yeah, of right. this precious rum. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do, just so you know, we have been drinking since earlier this evening. So as oh, as this podcast goes on, we're going to get more and more slurry. It, it is uh, uh, eighty proof, forty percent alcohol, <coughs> but it's it's beautiful, smooth. So anyway, what I was saying was that um, what I was saying was that you know if a company hires us and they're like, oh, listen, would you do this job at this lower rate, and we'll make it up to you on the next one. I say, I. I, I I've worked in this industry for a long time. I've never seen that materialize. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that when people say that, they probably genuinely mean it, but it just doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Same thing with, a, with an artist that comes in. They say their rate's you know, 
you know, seven hundred dollars or six hundred dollars. I'm like, well, we can't pay for that one. We'll do four hundred. Like, okay, for this one job, I'll do four hundred. Well, I'm sorry, but from now on, in your in our mind, you're four hundred dollars a day. And when you come back with the five hundred, six hundred dollar rate, we're like, whoa, 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 what just happened? Mm -hmm. So it's a tough one because you want to get in, you want to show people what you can yep. do, but you also want to be able to kind of defend yourself. And and so I think there's a there's a happy compromise in there someplace. I was talking with Pia Grage about that last episode where. Um like he was saying, like, oh, you know, like, oh, like his whole philosophy was, you know, you could charge a hundred dollars, you could charge a thousand dollars, but the level, the ex expectation of what you're going to deliver is still going to be at a thousand dollars. Like they, yeah, yeah, you know, so if point. you're like, oh, I'm going to go in, like they can see what I do and then like we can renegotiate later right. and it's not going to be the case. Like you go in an Excel spreadsheet as this is your rate. And I've seen uh, spreadsheets where it's like, this person like jumped rate excessively the next time we hired him and it's kind of like a, a little bit of a red flag yeah. next to their name and yeah. the thing is like you actually said the other day at lunch and i you know i've you know i've always believed that and i've i've been the same boat from both a, a being a producer as well as being an artist but i've never heard another producer ever kind of just acknowledge it not like yeah. we ever talk about it but like i've never heard anyone ever acknowledge it when you said it i'm like yes <laughs> like, it's, it's so fucking cool that you will say that because god but the thing is that like at the end of the day uh, it really does come down to that it's just like you price yourself out to what you think you're worth and right. I, I've on the flip but, side but in that same thing don't price yourself out of the job because there's some yeah. jobs that I and, and I'm not sticking up for producers but what I'm saying is there's some projects that they just can't afford you mm -hmm. you know and it's just it just doesn't work and so so it, it, don't be offended it doesn't mean that you're not qualified for it it's just that the budget doesn't allow for something like that it just yep. and that's just something that you have to take into consideration when you're when you're putting together a, a bid for a project the way I approach it myself and like I had a meeting yesterday in Hollywood about this and like Hollywood it's there actually we go. kind of now cool. we're exciting here we are I've been in Santa Monica for so long it was actually kind of fun like I went to Capitol Records mm -hmm. and like going in the, in the building I was just like oh I, I could totally forget I'm in LA you know I don't know if you guys know or not but from from where we're sitting uh, in, in <laughs> Alan's studio you can see the Nakatomi building from the Die Hard uh, it's one my pride and joy and, yeah and it's pretty impressive and it is gleaning beautifully on the uh, the night sky tonight. I, I was telling you that, like, I always took pr pride in seeing that because I remember seeing that movie as a kid and thinking, like, L.A. is, like, this whole other world. Yeah, and, so far away. And now I'm looking out the window, I can see the Nokotomi Plaza. And, like, I feel like I made it. Yeah. And, and then I realized that if the building wasn't there, I'd have a clear view of the Hollywood sign. Because it's directly <laughs> Damn it! I, I didn't notice. I took a photo the other day and I zoomed in. I could see the D. And I'm like, shit. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, well, basically what I was going to get at was that um, yesterday I, I had a meeting and yeah, they, they told me my rate and I, they asked me my rate and I said, okay, well I want this. And then they came back with like, oh, that's, that's really high for what we currently need. Right. Typically, I, I will always say that like if you get a negotiation, I will say it's better to go over email just because you've got a bit more of a chance yeah, to get a little more time to think about it. Yeah. yeah. And even sometimes like not replying for a couple of days, they may come back yeah. with, you know, and that's what I love about Chris. Chris is such a quiet guy. Like, rule of thumb in negotiations is the person who says the least yeah. has the most power. And um, Chris is definitely a quiet guy. And it's more because he's such a thinker that he's he's an introvert Very in that true. way. Well, in this regard, though, um, basically, rather than leaving for email, I, I did talk about on the spot yeah. initially. And yeah, I, I could have been like, well, that's my rate and that's my rate. Or I can say, okay, well, let's do it for like $20, $30 cheaper. Um, but you know, I just say like, look, that's what I charge. Yeah. Uh, however, I know that budgets aren't always the same. And if your budget isn't quite up there, then, you know, let's talk more. Yeah. Um, you got my email address. We'll just chat more about it. I'm flexible. Go off the cuff and chat about it more, yeah, like, yeah. whatever. It's interesting. We have a similar thing that we deal with a lot, you know, cause most of blinds work comes from advertising agencies and, and it's, it's incredible. I can't tell you how many times we get calls from advertising agencies and they're and they're like well we got this project and we think you're perfect for it and, we, and, and normally we are because we're so good but <laughs> then they come to us and they're like well how much would it cost and then I say well I, you know it all depends we can design an amazing project that everyone loves but no one can afford so why don't mm -hmm. you give us a better idea exactly. of what you want to spend and so then then they inevitably uh, and sometimes this is not always true because they're getting better at doing this but sometimes they'll come back to us and like well you tell us because we don't know uh, we don't have a number. And then, you know, then uh, just, just sometimes just to 
get some sort of reaction, I'll throw out a number that's way too high. You know, five hundred thousand dollars. Like, whoa, whoa. Well, we only have ten thousand dollars. So it's like, well, god damn it, you knew how much you wanted to spend. Why exactly. You, can, oh, I'm very busy. You're very busy. Just tell me about how much you have to spend. Either I'll tell you we can do it, or I'll tell you that we can't, and I'll make a recommendation for someone that can. Yep. But it's just like, please, please just stop doing that. You know, it's just like, because, and, 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 and they're trying to play the game, and, and I appreciate that, and I understand where they're coming from. They're trying to save their clients some money or trying to make more money for their company. But it's just, it, in the, it's cut to the chase, be honest, be direct. And, mm-hmm. and and just you know make the make it a, a better process from every for everyone from the very beginning. Yo, I, I had sorry, the, I just went off a little tangent. No, 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 there. like uh, no, you hit it on the head. Like yeah. I had um like Mad Max Four is about to come out. I got approached about some marketing stuff for the movie, and they came to me. They called me up at like nine o'clock at night, and they're like we need to get this stuff done. Yeah. And the thing is, and this is more on a tangent, but like I actually was recommending they don't hire me. Yeah, that they go a different route altogether, just because. I knew that I'd be out, like, just the direction they were going ahead with doing 3D crazy shit, it yeah. would be out of their budget. And I said, like, okay, look, let's go on the phone. I educated them about yeah, yeah, the whole process and I said, look, to do it this way is going to cost a lot more money. Here are the risks. Here's the reasons why it costs more money. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, if you want, shoot me an email, let's follow up. But, you know, personally, I would suggest doing this. It's a lot cheaper. Um, if you want to go with me, I don't even know if I'm available, but we can talk more. Otherwise, I won't leave you in the dark. I'll recommend other people who are cheaper who Perfect. can do the yeah, job for yeah. you. Now, they email me back, and I put together a schedule bid. And one thing is, and this isn't going to apply to everything, but if you can guide them, it builds comfort. It makes them yeah. feel like, yeah. okay, here's a schedule, here's a budget, yeah. here's all these well, other you have options. to position you have to position yourself as an expert. You know? Yeah, it, you, know, you invisibly do that by yeah, doing that. Exactly. And you take the lead rather than them taking the lead. Instead of please, sir, can I have but a the, job? The, but the hard thing about what you're doing is you're doing all of this work for free, right? Yeah, but I condensed it into about 15, 20 minutes. Mm, okay. But I, I agree. I mean, you know, I I told them because I knew they were in a hurry. I'm like, I'll get you something tonight because I'm, I'm busy. But I'm like, shit, that means I've got to actually go and do some work tonight. Like, right. I don't want to do that. You hang up the phone, you're like, damn it. Yeah, but uh, I did. I, I gave them a budget and then they came back because originally, like, how much is this going to cost? Right. And they wouldn't give me numbers. And I yeah, said, of course, yeah. okay, it's going to cost this much. They're like, okay, well, we only want, you know, have this much money, which is exactly what you said. Yeah. Um, the thing is, with them, I said, look, I can do it for this much money. This is what I'm comfortable with. Yeah. I can do it for cheaper, but that's when you're making sacrifices. And, mm-hmm. and the, that's the one thing I hate with the whole budgeting process is that, you know, this is actually how I explained it to them now. I remember I said, I could do it for $800. I could do the whole fucking thing yeah. for $800. It's going to look like crap and yeah. I could do no, it in it's a gonna day. It's going to be happy, yeah. But we can do it for a million dollars and it's going to look fantastic. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you need to know, I need to know what you're you're working with and then we can meet you. Yeah, and you'd limit, not limit their expectations, but you set their expectations of what they're actually going to get. Yeah. And if that's what they want, great, move forward, you know. Yeah, and there's yeah. a thousand different ways you could do something. Yeah, you, yeah exactly. You do something in Photoshop or you could, and I've fucking done that. Like, yeah. I've, I've done commercials where they say, well, we're, we need to cut the budget. I'm like, okay, well, now half the elements are in Photoshop. Yeah. Like, done. Yeah. And, and we've done the same thing too. Where, so they'll come to us and they have some grandiose idea. And, and, and particularly in advertising, it's not necessarily about how it looks. You're trying to convey a message. So it doesn't matter if it's flat, kind of 2D sort of graphics that are fun and you're, you're conveying that same sort of message. And in some regards, it's almost more effective because you're, you're being more artistic and trying to figure out ways to solve a problem. And that's one of the things that we do at Blind is we solve problems. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we pride ourselves on. Because it's not about, I mean, if we could just... If we were a company that just took the clients' boards and just kind of recreated them and put them out there, you know, then we're just a then you're just a we're just a cog in the wheel. We're yep. just a service. But we actually take them, figure out ways to make it better and more effective, and and figure out exactly what like these boards are great. But what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the what are you trying to communicate to the client that we can help you communicate a little better? And then we take it in and kind of you know put our own spit and polish on it and then put it back out to them and usually they're like oh my gosh i didn't even realize that that this was an option or this sort of thing worked mm-hmm. and, and most of the time it comes out really good from the minute you walk into blind like they've got just so many subtle touches that just work I yeah. mean, even just being a reception you're like sitting down and you're like welcome alan on the yeah, on the, the TV, and it's just like fuck. Oh, we All got right. new lamps today in the front. Oh, yeah. yeah, you got to come in and see well, them. Yeah. I love the chairs. I mean, yeah. everything about it. It's, it's got a really good feel to it. Like, I actually remember um, with the art director I walked into the first time I came in the building. Um, 
I, you know, just after we finished God of War, uh, I remember walking in there and I remember saying like, this is the kind of office that I want. Like mm. it's just, it had just like a really good vibe to it and everything about it just felt perfect. And like, it's the subtleties that you want. Like, yeah. you know, you don't need something busy. You don't need something over the top. You don't need fucking trophies all up in the yeah, wall. Yeah. It's, and it's, we have got a few of those, but yeah. And I think, you know, Chris really wanted to create a place that was a, a creative place for creative people to be creative. And, and you get that right when you come in the front door, you know, and, and so it brings the best, it elevates everyone when they come in there from mm-hmm. the, from the client to the, the, you know, the creative directors at the advertising agencies or the editors or whatever, or the people that we hire, you go in there and you're like, Oh, this is the, the, not that it's serious, but it elevates your level of creativity. And mm-hmm. this is, this is top notch advertising, you know, put yeah. to, put to work. And, and, you know, and, and unfortunately we get a lot of people calling us and they usually call me and they want something that's that's you know like what we do and unfortunately there's just sometimes a divide in what they can uh, afford and, and they have ten thousand dollars but they're asking for well, I wish it was even ten thousand dollars I mean I went round and round with this guy the other day and he had this great idea and I was like oh, this is really smart you know mm-hmm. I really like this and I want to do it but I said to him in an email I said I just I feel like you're not going to be able to afford a company like Blind, and um, and sure enough, he had two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And I was like, at that rate, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't even know how I could recommend a freelancer to help you. Yeah. So I, 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 that sounds really snobby, but you know, how do you how do you put a price tag on the? Ex- and it's not the it's not our facilities. It's not our you know it's not our ping pong table or you know our our book Chris's book collection or our trophies. It's really about how do you put a price tag, a price tag on the, the, the years of experience mm-hmm. that Chris brings to each project that Matthew and Greg are other creative directors. Like th- th- between them, there's 60 years of, of experience. Amy, you, and everyone. All of us, yeah. And that, that doesn't even yeah, count for the production side. And, and it's like you, you, can't, you can't quantify that. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so anyways, it's, it's, a, it's, a, tough, it's a tough racket sometimes to no, kind of explain right. that. So, experience yeah. like at the minimal uh, is going to save you tons of money just oh, from yeah. attractive mistakes. You know, yeah. like you come in and say, okay, well, I want to do all this stuff. And like, I'm going to, because I saw like a behind the scenes feature out of my yeah, DVD, yeah. I want to go and do all this stuff. It's like, well, look, we can, rather than recreating everything in 3D, we can do a map painting for that. Yeah, yeah. We can go shoot all this stuff. Yeah, you know again, what? Well, like, that's the problem solving that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. We've done this, this, and this, and this is really expensive. Like, yeah. you wouldn't believe it, but yeah. like, uh, when we were talking about doing um, this one project, it was a lot of slow motion, like, yeah, ink kind of stuff, like uh, underwater. Uh, you know, we're looking at like, underwater shoots versus, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, everything oh, I else. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, oh, shit, yeah. But whatever it's going to be, like, um, you bringing the experience to the table mm-hmm. is what makes the project work. And I've, I've been saying this a lot recently, t- which is that I think the most valuable thing that experience brings is the fact that you can play out a project in your head and then yeah. be like, okay. Here are the pitfalls. You, yeah, yeah, you haven't thought about this, this, and this, yeah. and these are the problems we're going to run into. Yeah. And that's what I also hate about managing teams where you tell them the problems they're going to run into weeks ahead of time and then one by one they run into them all because they weren't listening and you're like I fucking told you three months ago and but that's just it like you're saving time from doing that so like you know people will look at that like well I don't want to pay the overhead when it's really it's an investment yeah yeah it's not so much the overhead it's just yeah yeah I mean how do you put a price tag on the on the experience what are some of the projects you worked on what is your babies that you're really proud of you can look back and um, and say that those were the the ones that I loved and I reminisce yeah yeah Um, well I think you know for for a while there you know I was working freelance and then um, I uh, I got hired actually I was working at blind for a little bit as a freelancer and I was hired by um, you know, Jennifer Miller at Blur to work on the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo main title sequence. And so I kind of, I stopped working at Blind, you know, let them know it was super clear. And I, and I went and started working over there. And I think that was a real, that was probably, 
you know, you talk about those real moments of, mm -hmm. of projects that, that you really want to work on. And that was one of them because, you know, one, I got a chance to work with Blur. I've always been a big fan of those guys' work. Fincher as well. But I also got to work with David Fincher. And I got to work directly with him, too, on, on several occasions. And, uh, you know, so that was just one of those, like, bucket list sort of th stuff yeah. that I could just check off my list. And that was, that was a great one. And it was, you know, I went to my wife beforehand and I just said, listen, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to work the next you know, three, I think it was three months or so, and it's going to suck. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be around. And so if you have a problem with that, just let me know and I won't take it. But if I'm mm -hmm. going to do it, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm, you're gonna, gonna go I'm, I'm going all in. And it was a, it was a real interesting ex experience. I think, I think one of the reasons they brought me in is I had done a lot of main title sequences before that. And Blur is divided into two different departments. You know, the, Jennifer runs the design animation department which is fantastic and then tim uh you know runs the whole i don't know vfx mm -hmm. side of things and for this main title sequence they really need someone to bridge the two departments and since i'd had experience in both of those worlds they brought me in um so it was interesting because i was working on i was working with both both departments but i was also working as a uh, between a, a wife and a husband, which is kind of a weird kind of yeah. position to be put in. That's right. But I, you know, I love those guys, and, and I love them both. The, the project was so super fun to work on. It looks amazing. Um, you know, it was really cool, and and just having, um, you know, just having occasionally, you know, an email, an email would come in, and it's from Fincher. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like holy shit, this is David Fincher, and you know, there's so many horror stories about working with that guy. And to be honest with you. He is the nicest guy in the whole world. If you are working as hard as he is, then you're fine. What are the hard... Because like, I remember reading his first ever feature film was... was I was actually thinking about this earlier, but like um, with Sigourney Weaver, it was like Alien 3. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like he pissed her off and it pretty much... It set him back uh, like six or seven years back into yeah, yeah. car commercials and doing his thing. But like... I'm sure he learned his lesson from that. But it's more he just was new to the gig. And, yeah. But yeah. I mean... What, yeah, I was just curious. I mean, I've never heard that since that he's. I just heard just like mean stuff on the set, you know, just right. like him yelling at people or whatever. But I think you know one of the things that we went to the set one day to shoot some some footage of uh, Mara Rooney and and Daniel Craig, and um, you know we walked in and it was during we were sitting outside the sound stage stage, and when they were shooting in the states, and you know they break they they come in we kind of sit down and they're like okay um, you know we're gonna do a few more takes. And then um, we'll let you guys, you know, shoot your footage. And I'm like, great. So we're kicking back, kind of making ourselves comfortable. And then they're like, all right, and action. They're shooting on the red, so they're just rolling. Hmm. And he's like, and then you hear the, you know, the, the camera assistant. It's like, take 75. Oh, and I was shit. like, oh, my God. So they went on and shot scene after scene after scene. The same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And he's like, just do it again. And he wouldn't give any direction. It wasn't like, do that again with a little more feeling, a little less feeling. Don't hit this. So he he just do it again. Just no, more just do, he, I don't know if he was breaking him down or what. Mm -hmm. But, man, it was just rough. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. So anyways, they cut after, like, take 90 or whatever. And then I was just, all I could think about was like the poor editor having to sift through all that stuff and the, yeah. and the DIT, you know, like just having this just hard drive after hard drive of material. Anyways, and then we got to work with Daniel Craig and, and Mara Rooney and, and Daniel Craig, to his credit, that guy is committed. I mean, we were, we were just shooting some facial expressions for them to map on some other, uh, those some models that we created. And um, one of the things we asked him to do was throw, you know, like pretend like he was throwing up mm -hmm. and, um, and he, he just started, I mean, I thought he was going to throw up right there on a well, set. He was just we're like, whoa, 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 calm down, dude. This is just, you know, we'll figure it out later. We can fix it in post. But anyway, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the, the other part that was really cool about that experience is that we needed a little girl um, to play the part of Mara Rooney, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, when mm -hmm. she was a kid. And uh, because I don't know if you guys have seen the main title sequence, but what it's supposed to be and what uh, Fincher and Tim had talked about was this idea that it is a... Um, it's a fever dream. It's a, uh, it's like the, and it's an explanation of her past and what she's gone through, but seen through this kind of dis distorted mind of a, of a, of a, uh, of a dream that you would have if you were super sick. So we needed a, we needed a character to play her when she was a little kid. So we got some pictures of some daughters that were, you know, employees of the studio. And I submitted my daughter's, um, mm -hmm. photos in there as well. I think I heard this. And yeah, and it was kind of cool. So he, um, so I get an email back from Fincher that says, I like Peyton. And mm -hmm. I was like, yes, you know, like I was trying to stay neutral, but I wanted so bad for him to pick. Awesome. So he actually, so she went up there and, um, 
what's his Nick Tessie? Is that his name? The guy that does 3D imaging of anyway. Yeah. So he did a 3D model, and 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 unfortunately I couldn't break away. But so she actually, he actually, sorry, my daughter actually worked with Fincher for a little bit on That's the cool. on the thing. It's like how how many you know seven year olds yeah. get to work with Fincher? So um, but anyway, did, did that you was, show her movies like you know you got to do your background? And oh yeah, yeah. Features. I made her watch Seven. Oh, and, I was about to say. So. <laughs> You know, I'm a good father that way. That's right. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, I, I originally, um, I got approached to work on The Matrix in the day before I had agreed to work on George of the Jungle 2. And at the time, <laughs> yeah, not even number one with Brandon Fraser. This one was like a nobody piece of shit <laughs> sequel. And the thing is that like at the time, like my word was everything. I'm like, I'm not going to back out of a project that I agreed to do to go like, fly down and work like on a very pivotal shot on the matrix that they need to work on right and um but you don't know at the time uh, that the matrix is going to be the matrix you know well no i, I knew it was going to be big oh, and um, actually just so you know just a sidetrack i mm-hmm. got it i remember getting a job i got offered a job on um uh american beauty and as i and i had to turn it down because i took some other you know like the job is, uh, you know, like on a McDonald's commercial or something. <laughs> but who, you know, they don't give away, uh, they don't give away uh, Academy Awards for, uh, for PAs. Yes. No. Um, yes. I'm sure they have a little secret club for them. So yeah, I turned down the Matrix, and since then I've turned down Lord of the Rings, I've turned down Avatar, I've fucking turned down hmm. so many fucking movies. And then yeah, with you, the day before that, I agreed to do a toy commercial, a toy car commercial for a friend. And the only reason he got me, like, I had been actively turning down work for months. And I, I even condoned him on this. I'm like, yeah, I've been telling PsyUp and all these other big studios, like, no, 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 no. He took me out, got me drunk, and then he said, do you want to work on my toy <laughs> Damn commercial? Damn it, that's what I should have done. I should have taken you out and gotten you drunk and then asked you to work on the Could've. Girl of the Dragon Tattoo. And then, yeah, the very next day, you're like, ah, are you available? I'm like, nope. Uh, and damn. you're like, oh, we're doing Girl of the Dragon Tattoo. And I'm like, I, I remember I said to you, Hold the position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Maybe I'll get that. fired or something. Yeah. And, uh, I remember yeah. actually I was standing out. So we were so we were we were just behind the gun. We just didn't have enough people to work on it. You know, so many people that didn't. We you know, ninety five percent of it was real flow, and we just didn't have you know, that much experience. It, it was yeah. that. Oh, you're saying you outsourced some of it too, right? What and you outsourced some of. The oh work. yeah, some of it. And and to be honest with you, a lot of the stuff we outsourced didn't really. I heard that Band out, so we yeah. ended up like bringing it back in house, and we hand animated some of the stuff. I mean, it was it Crazy. was tough. I mean, real flow is awesome, but it is a beast, you, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, especially when you're dealing with, you know, you're trying to get it to do a particular thing. It, it 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 it's a great fluid simulator because it simulates fluid. But if you wanted to do something different than that, yep. you know. And what's also too is we hired a bunch of people, and maybe this is something to be learned from this and, and people that are listening is that you know we had a lot of people that said that they could do something, mm-hmm. and we hired them not because we were desperate, but we needed additional people, and they couldn't. And I got to be honest with you, that like that's a horrible mark. Like, don't oversell yourself on mm-hmm. something you can't do. I know earlier I said, you know, you have to stop being a, you know, a junior artist and say you're a senior artist. Mm-hmm. But don't over, oversell your qualifications because if you get in there, you're going to be put to the test. And if you can't do it, the, the, you will burn bridges yep. forever. I mean, I've got just, I'm just thinking about three different names on that particular job of people that I would never talk to again, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I'd talk to them, I'd have lunch with them or whatever, but I would never recommend them or I'd never hire them for a project again. So. Um, no, that's actually a really good point. I mean, going back, rewind all the way back for a minute to yeah. what you were saying about, um, you know, reinventing yourself and never, like, under selling yourself. Like, I've seen the opposite too, where I've gone to interview artists and they've come in and they've basically, as a junior, given me my freelance rate. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, like. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I charge that rate and I've got 15, 20 years on you and you're charging that much money. Yeah. Um, at the same time, like, you know, so you need to kind of make sure you're not out selling yourself where you no one's going to take you seriously. And yeah. the flip side is like with um, hiring people is that I remember in God of War, I was going to bring someone on and I've known him for 10 plus years and I'm confident about his skills, but I knew him as something else, not an effects person. Yeah. And he basically was like, yeah, I'm, now I do effects. So I said, great, okay, well, just so I can place you in this production, like, what's your skill set? Like, what is the one thing you're really good at? Um, are you more of a, a fluids guy? And yeah, he's right. like, 
So he's like, yeah, fume effects, I'm the best in the world. Oh, and gee. I'm like, oh, okay, um, fair yeah. enough. Just that being said, if anyone says they're a guru, don't hire them. Go ahead. Um, and then after that, I said, okay, well, what about destruction, like thinking particles, stuff like that? Because I had specific things I was doing, and I'm like, great, if I can alleviate what I'm doing onto someone else, awesome. He's like, yeah, there's no one else around that's as good as me at that. Yeah. I said, okay, well, what about this? And he's like, I'm the best. <laughs> and at that point, I just couldn't hire him. And the thing is, he probably could have done a great job, yeah, but the fact yeah. that he was telling me he was the best at everything, like, I know my faults, and I am happy to say, like, look, I'm really confident in these areas by being genuine, by being able to say, look, you know, you don't need to be the best at everything. If you say, I don't know that, but I'm confident I can learn it, yeah. then they can say, okay, well, look, you know, we know that now, and it means that if we have someone else around, great. Otherwise, it'll fall on you, but we know what your limitations right, are. Right. It kind of reminds me of this story, I don't know if you know, behind Killing Zoe, the movie that uh, Roger Avery wrote and directed. But um, I think it was, uh, they were they were scouting locations for um, for Pulp Fiction, and they mm -hmm. found this bank, this beautiful bank in downtown L.A., and they scouted it out, and they, it wasn't, there was nothing in, in it for uh, Pulp Fiction. But um, Quentin called... Roger Avery and just said, listen, there is this bank and it is so beautiful and I want to shoot something there. Do you have any scripts that have a bank in it? Wow. And Roger Avery is like, you know what I do? I have a great script that that's takes place, you know, probably 50%, 90% in a bank. And, and he's like, great, send that to me in the morning. So Avery hung up and he's like, oh shit, now I got to write this script. Totally that bullshit awesome. it is way. And he spent, but, but to his credit, he spent the next, you know, 48 hours writing Killing Zoe, which I think is a fantastic film. So I think if you if you can, you know, if you can follow through and you can learn something, mm -hmm. you know, and and master it in a short amount of time, it's not like a screenplay or whatever. I think that there's you know there's a little bullshitting that that's going to happen. It's you know? worth taking risks that you know you can back up. Yeah, but you know? yeah, but but if you can't back them up, then you've then you've done yourself a great disservice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, actually, I, what you said is so. So true. I mean, yeah, you, you can take risks, but there's going to be situations where if you're just saying like, yeah, I, I, I can do all this shit. Like, yeah. I, I'm a visual effects supervisor. You've never been on fucking set before yeah, in your yeah. life. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when everything's shot and everyone's wrapped and yeah. all the equipment, everything's gone and you've got a bunch of plates that are unusable. Yeah, you're like, oh like, shit, I should have put some tracking markers. That isn't, oh, you're going to be blacklisted, <laughs> that is going to be, you're going to get sued. Yeah. You know? um, and that's the thing is, you need to take all this shit into consideration. And I, but, but knowing like, okay, um, you know, I know what I can do, I know the extent of what I can do, and, yep. you know, I can, I can bend the rules a little bit. That's, yeah. you know, yeah. shit happens. And you have to progress somehow, so that's the way to do that. So, um, what was it like? You, you did that production, and, I mean, it turned out Girls amazing. Dream. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was cool, and, and, and the, the, the most amazing part was that, um, you know, Fincher would come in once a week or whatever, and a lot of the time on Saturdays. I, I, I don't know if I'm telling you something that I shouldn't, but I remember one time Tim had asked uh, Fincher, he's like, are you busy? And he said, I'm too busy to shit. I mean, that's the kind of busyness this guy was. So, yeah. But what was weird is, you know, we'd say, you know, hey, can you come in at 10 o'clock Saturday morning? So we'd show up, and he'd show up. And here's a guy that's too busy to shit, but he shows up at 9.45. Mm -hmm. And he hangs out, and he's t drinking coffee, just hanging out. And I'm, you know, still in the back of my mind. I'm like, fuck Dave Fincher. Mm -hmm. um, and he's talking friendly. But then, boom, 10 o'clock, he is like, let's see it. And we're like, fuck, it is business he is on he's got from 10 to 11 he sits down we show him the you know kind of work in progress and he sits there he's like show it to me again we show it again and i am just shitting my fucking pants because i don't know you know i'm just I, I just don't know and then he just and i've got my my iphone next to him i hit the record button i kind of slide it over to him as close as i can and i just listen to him talk because he's moving so fast mm -hmm. and he's and he and the, and the amazing thing is he uses a lot of film analogies and so it's like if you haven't seen the film that he's referring to, you are in the dark. There was this coordinator that worked on the project. She was a little younger, and she just missed a lot of the shit that he said because she hadn't seen the movies. And I saw, you know, I've seen most of the stuff, and I only got 90% of what he said. Yep. So, and then I remember one time... She's like, who is Hitchcock? The, yeah, yeah, who's this? Uh, so I remember one time he, um, he said, you know, I want you to do this, this, and this. And then I was trying to get a kind of a priority from him because, you know, there's a limited amount of time. The movie's coming out, you know. There's mm -hmm. fucking posters on the wall uh, you know, this movie's going to come out whether or not we're done with the main title sequence or not. And, um, you know, so I'm like, so he's like, do this. And I had this moment from Fight Club where I wanted to say, 
do you want me to make this your primary, my primary action item? And I didn't say it to him. I still to this day regret not saying that to him. I chickened out. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, we got it done. We stayed up super late. And then, um, interestingly enough, I got hired at Blind um, like a, a month before it was even done. And I just said, you know, I had made a commitment to, to, to finish this project, and, and I have to respect that. And, and Chris, to, to his credit, really respected that, that decision. So I finished, um, I actually, you know, we put, the, we, put it, uh, we put the main title sequence on a drive. I handed it to the post-production supervisor, and uh, I went to sleep, woke up, and went to blind the next day. That's awesome. I got a whole, I got a whole you know, night off. We were talking about um, how, you know, I did that one project with you, um, in person yeah. and then it's funny because when I went to go work on Priest uh, I worked on that um, pro you weren't actually on the project but I worked at, with that employer you were with and I remember I worked till 4 in the morning I literally had my bags all next to my yeah. desk and I went straight to the airport and I remember the next day the the guys at lunch were all kind of like talking by my back uh, on Priest in San Francisco and later in the day they were like you know, hey, like, you know, did you need sleep? And I'm like, no, I actually have not slept since <laughs> yeah. the day before. They're like, yeah, like, we could tell, like, you're really tired. I'm like, thanks. I guess. But, but yeah, like, you know, it's just one of those, like, you, you jump from one project yeah, out on the yeah. next. I remember Alan working on this one project that we did, and I was talking about this earlier. He showed up, uh, you showed up, and you weren't wearing, uh, you had, like, you had, like, one pair of jeans and a shirt. And mm -hmm. you were just like, you, I don't know if you forgot stuff, or you just didn't I literally just came or... from working on ILM. Yeah. I, I was going to go work on Priest, and I yeah. flew down to LA just for this one thing. Yeah, and I, and I remember you're like, I was like, hey, we're gonna go out to lunch, you wanna grab something? He's like, ah, I'm actually gonna go out and buy some clothes, cause yeah. you didn't have any, I think it was in storage or something, you know, so it was, yeah, so he showed yeah. you, you had like three pairs of pants. Actually, you're right, the, you're right, cause I've been living just out of my backpack. Yeah. I had nothing but a backpack. Yeah. It was yeah. awesome. That was pretty fun, yeah, exactly. That was actually a life-changing experience, like you try spending a year with nothing but you can carry on your back. I wanted to do that and it was the most alleviating. Was it? Is it alleviating the right yeah. word? But yeah, yeah, it, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. it was awesome. Like. Um, just be able to like, yeah, carry what you have. Yeah, and and I think there's a certain point of that too. Is like, what do you really need? Like, what? Are, mm -hmm. Maybe we're, this is too philosophical for this you no, know, no, podcast. No, I but agree. it's like, what do you really need? Like, you spend this whole time collecting all this stuff, and then you know, then there's a big earthquake, and you're like, fuck, what do mm -hmm. I really need? Well, I need food, I need water, and I need shelter. Yeah, you know? and that's it, kind of. You know, that's the thing. I look around all the stuff I have now, and like most of it actually was in storage. You were spot on, and um, like this big video game here. Oh, that too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but um, no, that's just it. Like I, I have a lot of stuff, but for me, I spent a year um, just without anything but my backpack. Yeah. And it was awesome. I had like two pairs of jeans, a couple of pairs of shorts, uh, shirts, socks, jocks, and yeah. I was good to go and a laptop. And it was amazing. It changed my life yeah. having that. And the thing is that it was almost frustrating because like my mom would buy me a book and I'm like, Fuck, I, I can't carry a book like Yeah, where am I supposed not, to put this? Yeah, like do you not see that like this is what I have? And um that's the thing, is like it was great, but it meant also that I can't afford baggage. Yeah. And um so as soon as people give you stuff, it's like I can't use that. You know, you buy me some socks, I can use them. Yeah. Yeah. Um there's actually a documentary someone decided to wear like travel the world with nothing but what he had on. Yeah. So every night he would have to wash his underwear and everything yeah, yeah, else. Yeah. But he did it. He successfully Yeah, did. there was a while there after college I kinda of, I kind of not, not freaked out, but I dropped out for a little while and I just lived up in the mountains in Colorado. And I literally awesome. had like a, like an old skate bag, like a duffel bag just full of stuff. And that was it. I mean, mm -hmm. that was it. Like all the other stuff. I think I put some stuff in the stores, like a mattress or whatever. But it was kind of cool because it was like, okay, this is really what you need. You know, I, I did have a laptop at the time, mm -hmm. you know, so that was cool. It could connect. And then the rest was just kind of, you know, extraneous stuff. And But I think, you know, to now, especially now with everything becoming digital, you know, there's... There's no need for a bookshelf anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about, do you have, you know, there's no bookshelf in here. iPad. Yeah, exactly. IPad, it's all there. You know, like I have a bunch of, I have like a drawer full of CDs someplace. And it's just like, oh my gosh. I mean, the, the thought is that someday I'm going to take time to digitize all these CDs. You know, mm -hmm. so I've got this library of music. But it hasn't happened. You know, and it's, it's so much easier just like, well, I've got an old like Mad Parade CD. You know Mad Parade? Mad no. Parade, no. Yeah, okay. I've got an old uh, Generation X CD, you know, right. and instead of, I could, I, I could take it and I could put it in my machine and I could download it, or I could just go ahead and buy it for, you know, 10 bucks on, on Yo, iTunes. I have, a, I have a bookshelf, but uh, yeah. all my books are actually in storage downstairs, but I did that before I moved to LA. Yeah. I had such a massive CD collection. I ordered this big storage pink bin, like um, like a garbage truck will drop it off kind of thing and yeah. leave it in your front yard. And 
I literally digitized everything and I was just throwing the CDs off my balcony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And I had them all mp 3 And then living in Canada, like I would have my DVD collection. And the thing is that I would be sitting on, on the couch and I'm like, I gotta get up and buy, I get a DVD, put it in the thing. I'll just download yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, know? that's so, I mean, it's so crazy at night. Like, I'm supposed to watch, I actually do this other podcast um, with the, called The Real Fools, where we review movies, mm-hmm. um, which is, it's a lot different from this because um, people actually listen to this podcast versus that one. But I, I'm supposed to watch, um, it, we, we review movies, and we, movie, <laughs> we review movies, and one of the ones I'm supposed to watch is a razor head. Well, I've got a DVD of a razor head, mm-hmm. but it's way up on my shelf, and I'd have to all walk the all the way over there mm-hmm. and to open it up and put it in the DVD player, Amazon. you know. And by that time, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just gonna watch Sherlock, you know. Yep. And, and, and yep. I haven't watched it, and I, that podcast actually is coming up. I need to prepare for that. I'm gonna run the restroom real quick. Okay. Do you want to push pause, or should I keep talking shit? You can say. Okay, I'm gonna tell a story. Pro- yeah. I'm gonna talk about your kitty. Come here, nice little pussy. La, 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 la. I'm trying to think of some scandalous things to say about Alan while he's out. Hmm. Let me see. Kitty, kitty. What is this? Seventh annual VES awards. J.J. Abrams. Nice. <sighs> Come on, cat. What do you think? Treat me cruel. Treat me like a fool. But love me. Take my broken heart. Tear it all apart. Um, do you want to talk about like the uh, Coldplay and yeah. Blind and then maybe yeah. I guess like artists working with those fucking assholes? Yeah. Hey, babe. Are you there? Hey. Uh, Hi. Hi. Just seeing the token. I like your kitty. Oh, you do? Yeah. She's been super friendly. Does it smell like stinky man and booze? Well, then we had to turn the air conditioning off, and I don't know if I put on deodorant tonight, so yeah, it's a bad. Oh my god. Yeah, he's not having one. Yeah, we fit. We finished off this bottle. Oh yes. But I am driving. Look at look at look at you. Give me some attention, please, mom. Look how cute I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I should probably start sobering up for the ride home. All right, well, let's dive back into it. All right. <laughs> nice to meet you. You're, you're yeah. working we'll be done up. soon. I'll, I'll let you have Alan back. What is the VS Awards, by the way? Uh, the VS Awards? Visual yeah. Effects Society. It's, oh. um, Are you going? Maybe. Um, if you need giving, a date for any of that kind of shit, let me know. You're giving J.J. Uh, Abrams yeah, the I saw that. this year. Yeah. I was looking through your mail while you were... Uh, oh, right. I mean, debt. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I paid a couple of your bills, too. Cool. Appreciate it. Maybe you can work on your computer or do whatever you want to do. I'm staying away from computer. Good well, for that, you. That's the first. Looking at 3D things for a... For a thing. Yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll knock through this and we'll... Yeah, we're almost done. So, um, just jumping back on track, I mean, another one of your projects was the new Coldplay music video. Yeah. And what was that like? It was great. I think that, um, you know, we talked about the, the growth of Dragon Tattoo being kind of a highlight in my career. And I think the Coldplay one was too. You know, we finished it just over a month ago. And so one of the reasons that Chris put so much importance on music videos uh, at Blind is that it really helps our creative department be, you know, get those creative juices flowing. And I think also too, as um, you know, creative directors at advertising agencies who are mostly the people that hire us are looking for inspiration for their next spot. They're not looking for other commercials. They're looking for music videos or other animations or, or such that have been done. So a lot of the time they'll see music videos. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so we were having a meeting and we were talking about doing a music video for the year. And 
we were like, well, you know, if we're going to do a music video, and, and most likely for free, because music videos don't have any budgets. I was going to touch on that, but yeah. 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 And we're like, well, let's just do it. Let's do it for the biggest band in the world. And so I had had a pre existing relationship with uh, Phil Harvey, who's the, the creative director of Coldplay. And he's actually like the fifth member of Coldplay. Um, he's been with them from the very beginning, he used to be their manager. Um, so I, I reached out to him and I said, listen, we want to do a music video for you guys. And he'd been wanting to work with us for a long time. And um, so we just, you know, we presented to them three ideas. And the idea that they really kind of gravitated to was the one that had an interactive component. Because I think, you know, passively watching videos is, is uh, something that's uh, of a bygone era. And they wanted people to really watch their video they wanted to watch it again and they wanted to watch it again because then you're starting to listen to their songs it's starting to really sink in mm -hmm. and so they had this the last single from the uh ghost stories album is a song called ink and we created a, a music video that that kind of tells us journey of a of a, of a lone kind of sailor person a lone guy it's a combination of chris martin but it's also they were this album was really inspired by um the Iliad and, the, and then mostly the Odyssey by uh, Homer. And so it's a journey that this guy goes through to, to, to get back to his lost love, Penelope. And, you know, there's there's pitfalls along the way. And, and that kind of fit really well with this interactive component where you get to kind of choose which direction you want to go. And if you go one way, you know, it offers one answer, solution, one path. If you go another way, it's a different one. And so after doing the math, there's... 336 different versions of the video so unfortunately instead of creating a you know four minute and 25 second video mm -hmm. I think there was something like 13 or 12 or 13 minutes worth of content that we had to create for the spot but um, it just I mean for us it was just such a great opportunity and and to work with Phil and 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 the guys with the band was really nice and and those guys are so great they came by the studio on on several occasions and they are just the nicest. You, I mean, for being such a huge band, they are the nicest guys in the world. I mean, they're so nice. They have a, they had like a personal assistant. I mean, it was weird. It was like the president was coming. The energy in our studio was palpable. I mean, it was just like people. I love it. Like, like people that didn't, well, like knew, you know, normally spend the rest of the day in their office were suddenly like milling around the office uh, more than they normally do. And um, you know, they have these two black SUVs that roll into our parking lot, and then. They have a, like a like not a personal assistant, but this woman that gets him in the store door. But once she gets him in the door, she's gone. She's not like pandering to them at all. She's like, I've delivered my package. She mm -hmm. shook my hand and she was gone. Great. And so we spent a lot of time with those guys, just talking to them, showing them stuff. And then I think the best part for me was when we're sitting there, we're showing the video to Chris Martin, and about three quarters of the way through, he stops us and he says, "Listen," he's like. You guys are artists. I'm an artist. He's like, I wouldn't want someone to give me advice on how to do my art. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you advice on how to do your art. And, and after that, we were just like, okay, we're, we're done here. You know, it was neat because Chris, our, That's great. It was like, uh, sorry, Matthew, our creative director, still wanted to get input. And I'm like, dude, we're done. Like, yeah. if he, if he you're likes like, it, you're Matt, yeah, Matt yeah, like, shut yeah. up, dude. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, they still actually did give us some additional input, to, which was really helpful. But um, it was just like, it was just, it was a cool, cool experience. experience. And, you know, once I think that the thing is that we just needed to convince Chris that we were professionals and that we mm. were, because, you know, he doesn't necessarily know. But that's that. awesome. It means like he believes in you as artists yeah. and he trusts yeah. you. And that's what your ultimate goal as artists is yeah. going to be is that, we know what we're doing. Yeah. We we have something that we want you to trust us to deliver to you. Yeah. And yeah, that was really neat. And then he walked around the studio for a bit. It was funny because he was playing with a. He we were introducing them some of the team, and uh, he was, saw one of the guys working on a Wacom tablet, mm -hmm. and he's like, "What's that?" And you know, so weird. We we see them all day, and we know right. exactly what they are. But he had never seen one before. So the artist very kind of shyly like showed him how it worked, and he was fascinated. He loved it. That's I think awesome. he was going to go out and buy one the next day. So yeah, he was a great guy, and the guys in the band were really cool. And so and they invited us to a show that they that they did downtown, like That's a nine hundred awesome. nine hundred seat thing. Actually, uh, Phil got um, me and my wife in because it was our anniversary, and we went backstage. It was like. My, I told my wife, I'm like, you know, this, this is kind of a big deal. There's going to be some people there. And she's like, no, it's not. I'm like, okay, cool. And um, so uh, Matt Damon was there and mm -hmm. some other actress that I don't know. And then um, uh, Henry, no, Harry from 
One Direction was there. Okay. Who's my daughter's like favorite. Okay. So my wife tries to take a picture of, I'm going off track, I know, but no, no, no. Uh, my wife tries to take a picture of Henry just to show Harry, sorry, Harry, tries to pick, take a picture of Harry to show my daughter. And as she does, she's doing it on the sly, she takes a picture, the flash goes off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she's so, oh my God, Harry is shooting daggers at my wife. So, oh, I'm in the bathroom right now with Matt Damon. No. With Matt Damon. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so she goes in. She's like, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I want to get a picture of you. My daughter's your biggest fan, and blah blah blah." So she takes a picture with with mm-hmm. uh, with um, Harry, and I come out and I'm like, "Hey, I just took a piss with Matt Damon." And she and she's like, "We've got to get the fuck out of here." Like she just like couldn't. So That's I grabbed awesome. two free beers out of the you know the free bar, mm-hmm. and we bailed and went downstairs. So, That's awesome. Yeah, it's a fun story. I when I was 21, I uh, went to the House of Blues. Never been there before in my life. And um, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no Vegas. Not Irvine. Oh God. Yeah. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do that? Um, yeah. Anyway, so like one of my my buddies, his roommate was the drummer from Rancid, yeah. and um, I I didn't know who Rancid was, but I'd heard the band, so heard of them. So I went there and I ended up going backstage, as in like I was on the backstage of the House of Blues right. with three levels of people all like packed cheering and I'm like yeah. I don't know who these guys are but I'm up yeah, there yeah, with but them. Like, like, and it was awesome and I know Lars the uh, the bassist of Rancid oh you do yeah. Good. wait Lars what else is he in he was in a punk rock band up in San Jose that's how I knew right him. cause he's I, yeah um, so I ended up going backstage backstage with them so like yeah. you know and House of Blues Hollywood backstage yeah. with Rancid and like all these other celebrities and I expected it to be like amazing and it basically was just a bunch of people hanging out yeah. and then like a lineup of people who wanted to hang out with yeah, them yeah. and all of us are sitting on a couch chilling with like Rancid and yeah. these other people. And it was also what I noticed too is it was a lot of like like attorneys, you know, right. like the stereotypical like, yep. you know, attorneys and like with hair plugs and stuff and their and their over Botox wives and stuff. Right, right, and, right. And then us, you know. Well, I don't know, it blew like... It kind of ruined my dream of the whole yeah. thing. And then yeah. afterwards, I ended up walking with the drummer to his car. And he's like, oh, yeah, we should get you guys some shirts and blah, blah, blah. And then he starts going on about, like, yeah, I'm on this, like, total health kick right now. It's awesome. Like, everywhere we go, like, they give us, like, baskets of, like, fruit and granola bars. And, like, so I just take it all home with me. And I eat granola bars and fruit all day long. And I'm like, you're ruining my entire dream right now. <laughs> I want to know about cocaine and hookers. Yeah, no, that's what I expected. It was just, like, that I see them my yeah. CD, like, yeah. rock star in Hollywood. And this is, like, my fucking granddad would be cool with this. But, um... I read this book as a, one of the writers from Forbes. He wrote a book. I think it's called Empire State of Mind. It was about Jay Z mm-hmm. and Jay Z just as an entrepreneur and being yeah. really amazing at branding and what he does. Yeah, yeah. And like, um, what was really cool is he talks about how Jay Z went on to fuck. I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin this. Um, he took over one record label. I can't remember which record label it was. It wasn't Virgin. It was a different one, but a really massive record label. And this was his first job. Uh, right out the bat was to um, release the Roots new album and right. so the whole idea was not to fuck it up and like you know yeah. be like okay Roots being an artistic band like we're going to make you in like a big pop band and sell lots of records you just wanted them to do the thing and it wasn't it was literally 24 hours before their album had to go out to print to press that they realized that they didn't have the rights for this sample that was oh, actually shit. from a Coldplay yeah. song and so the roots were fucked because like they spoke to Coldplay's lawyers and Coldplay's lawyers were like, we need eight hundred thousand dollars for the sample, oh, which yeah. was unheard of at the time. Yeah. So he reached out to Jay Z and he's like, called him up. He's like, we have about four or five hours to get the rights to this thing. Can yeah. do you know anyone who knows Coldplay? And then Chris Martin called up about two hours later and he, he's like, what do you need? And he's like, you know, we love your band, we really respect you, and we just need the sample. It's yeah. like the, it's the key hook for our main radio song that we need to release and and Chris Martin was just like fine it's yours yeah, go for it yeah nice so uh, I, I'm i not the biggest fan of Coldplay I'm not really into their music but yeah. you know just everything about them it sounds like they're cool fucking people yeah yeah you can really respect what they do and, and their artistry for sure and the, you know they've been around for a while and I think this album in particular was really kind of intimate and small I think it had a lot to do with his breakup with um, or decoupling with um with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and and didn't have that big epic like sort of mm-hmm. you know an- uh, anthem sort of vibe that the other pieces did which kind of lended itself to to a animated video 
you know, versus doing this big, gigantic, you know, like, you know, yeah. shots of the stadium and stuff. I think it really worked for that particular So episode. when you did 13 minutes, I mean, that kind of reminds me of the 80s where you do these, like, big budget. Like, Michael Jackson is one that comes to mind. Yeah. He's done several. But, like, you know, you do these big budget extended clips that yeah, are yeah. essentially are a movie yeah. that they're trying to make out of it. And, um, I mean... Was it something you guys did with it beyond the music video, or no? I mean, it was just the, just because of the different choices that you make in the interactive component. We needed all those different mm. different timelines to 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 make up one music video. So right. So yeah, I mean, so it would take you I don't know a couple hundred days to to watch it all. That's awesome. Yeah, I fun. actually I did a clip for Young Empires. It's Canadian. Um, I love it because my girlfriend knew who they were. Yeah, I've nice. never heard of them, but like. Yeah, the, uh, Young Empires is called White Doves. They're like a Canadian band. And like, they were doing this whole new interactive Facebook feature where uh, I, I love the idea because basically there's like a lot of shots where there's meant to be photographs um, on a wall. And what happens if, if you watch it through Facebook because it's all tracked, it will replace oh, while you're watching. it with your yeah. photos. Oh, Which was a great idea. And just kind of seeing where that kind of stuff would go. Yeah. It's like, fuck, like, you know, you're... You're going to be in the music video, like, yeah, for um, sure. Well, like I said, you know, the, the, these the days of just passively watching TV are mm-hmm. over. You know, whether you're shazamming a TV show, you know, to mm-hmm. get behind the scenes, or it's like a, you know, where you're watching The Walking Dead and you've got, you yeah. know, your iPad going at the same time, and then just like the, you know, the 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 technology that like Interlude, which is the company that we worked with to create the music video for Coldplay, a lot of that stuff. I mean, now you'll be able to watch a TV show. You run your mouse over a shirt that a star is wearing, you know, boom, it'll tell you, you know, but you can buy this shirt at H&M, you know, mm-hmm. or those sunglasses or whatever. So everything is going to be, it's going to be a TV show and it won't be like horrible product placement like it is on like American Idol where they're like Coca-Cola or Ford, you know, yep. it'll just be like some guy will be wearing a Tom Ford suit and you click on his shirt, it'll bring up another window in your monitor and they'll tell you where to buy that suit. And, you know, I own Tyler Durden's red jacket from Fight Club. Do you really? Yep. No, not his exact one, but like oh. the exact same. Can make. I borrow it for Christmas? Because, uh, I mean, for Halloween? Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Because I've always wanted to go as Tyler Durden for Halloween. Really? Yeah, I have it. Okay, remind me to follow up with you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, it's exactly those kind of things. It's just like, fuck it, why not? Yeah. I'm, I'm going through a pretentious period. I'm yeah. money, so like, <laughs> let's do something stupid. Um, that's great, man. That's really cool. I mean, and that's what I love about Blind is like you, you guys are so creative and... Like we talked about this recently, where I think you were mentioning that you want to get more into branding. But I mean, you guys to me are someone who successfully does brand really well. Like mm. subtlety is where you guys stand out. Like you, it's not like it's in your face, but yeah, like yeah. you, everything you guys do just kind of. Um, and I'm not kiss assing at all, but like it, Go ahead. it, it breathes uh, quality. Yeah, you know, it's it's subtlety of quality, and like and that's you know, it's just got this strong presence about it, and like I really like that about you guys. And from the minute I've walked into your offices to everything I see you guys do, it, it does kind of have that about it. And uh, Chris, um, yeah, it's just a quiet but very strong-minded guy. He knows yeah. what he wants. And, and he also does, it's rep. not like a thing he comes and says, you know, like, we have to have it, you know, be this quality coming mm-hmm. out. It's just kind of an unspoken thing, you know. It's yeah. just you come and you work there and you see the kind of quality that we've put out in the past and, and you just got to keep that that kind of level going you know what's the typical process when you start a production like obviously people come in they say we want something yeah they I mean, may have some reference but you come up with boards you yeah i think a lot of the time it's it's um a lot of the time it's you know an advertising agency that's come up to us they've come up with some initial ideas that they kind of like and then unfortunately you know one of the things we're trying to get rid of is pitching you know we're just yeah. we i think we talked about this it's at such lunch a money the day. Just, money burner too it's just like, not a good it's just not a good use of resources for no. for anyone to be honest sorry with you. it's very uh, political to say. yeah we could we could talk <laughs> there's another second episode right there the win without pitching one but you know a lot of the time you know probably 80 percent, 70 percent of our jobs still are, are can, can are i interrupt pitched. for a second yeah actually to say that it goes back to the confidence thing where you talk about chris martin you guys, you know, you want to get to a level where you're reputable enough that people are going to come to you. And it's kind of like, if a, you know, you don't get Tom Cruise to audition. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you get blind. It's like, we love your work. We want you to come on board. And yeah. like, worst case, you do a retainer. Like, we'll get you to come in and do something. Yeah, right. Or the time, do the but, initial, like do an initial phase, get it started yeah, and whatever. But, but ultimately it's like look we love your work we want to work with you yeah. and you have that trust and that confidence yeah and a lot of the time you know they're required by the client to do a triple bid 
And I don't know if that's bullshit, but you know, it's like, well, if you just listen, if you just need a bid, I'll create a bid for you. Tell me what number you needed to do. I'll put it in a bid and mm-hmm. I'll give it to you. And then don't, but don't waste our creative time. Cause you know, if we if we're pitching on a project, yeah. we're, we've got like, we've got three or four people, a creative director working on a bid and I'm sorry, on a pitch. We've got the, you know, uh, our head of production and me working on a, on a bid for the project. Don't waste our time. If we're not going to, if we don't have a chance, you know, and, or even to that case, don't even talk to us. Just hire the people that you're going to hire. You're burning money. And, 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 and I would appreciate them doing the same with me. I mean, I remember this project, this company reached out to us. Actually, we just did a project for Trojan. Mm-hmm. For this new uh, like lube that they have, I got and it, it was with a um, oh yeah, I brought you a sample, uh, <laughs> and it's and it was with this Rorschach test, Your, uh, yeah, I got, and um, and and as we were going through it, I was like, please don't pitch us against someone else because we're going to win this, and I don't want to waste. You know, I felt bad <laughs> for anyone else. It, I mean, the Rorschach test is what blind does. You know, whether it's been the crazy video that we did for Nars Barkley a while back, the Audi stuff. It's like, if you want a Rorschach test, you reach out to Blind. What you know? is that? Oh, the, you know, the, the ink blot test that they give to crazy oh, people. You, and they, yeah, what do you see? Oh, I see, a, I see yep. a butterfly fucking a, a unicorn. Um, <laughs> but, but it's like, don't waste our time. You know, don't waste their time. Don't waste our time. Don't make us pitch on something that we don't know anything about. Let's just engage in this project and get it started. Oh my gosh, I went off on a tangent. So your question was the process. So yeah, they'll come to us. We'll put together, we'd like to have a call because we don't like, we really, one of the things that Blind does and I let the producer know right off the bat, we're going to ask some really hard questions Mm -hmm. because we don't want to blindly go into a pitch. It doesn't make any sense. Again, you said a waste of time. We ask some really tough questions like, what are you trying to accomplish? What, What is the goal here? These are your boards, but you know, do you, you, they're like, we just want you to plus our board. Well, what's the ultimate goal? Mm-hmm. We ask some really tough questions so we can get answers, so we can address the real questions in our presentation versus just, you know, like, here's your boards, but prettier, you know? So we'll present boards, um, the job, uh, you know, awards to blind. We then pass it off to our, you know, our production team, usually Scott, who's our, our in-house producer. Um, and, it's, and it's coupled with a uh, creative director, um, you know, and then we just create a schedule and we have, we like to have a lot of check-ins along the way to make sure because, you know, there's nothing worse than going through the design phase, moving on to the animation phase. And then they're like, oh, we want to change something in the design. It's, like, you, hey, it's, it's phasing. You, yeah, you lock down one. For sure. Before. And it's like once we're, once, you know, obviously there's going to be tweaks here and there, but it's like once we're done with the design phase, cool, it's mm-hmm. locked. Show that to the client. Don't, I mean, we work with a lot of people and unfortunately the, the creatives don't have the authority of the wherewithal to share it to the client show it to the client or the client mm. isn't sophisticated enough to understand a work in progress yep. they're like wait isn't the, how is this going to animate i mean I've, I've i've showed like people like grayscale tests you know and they're like is this going to have more color it's like oh please uh, I, I had uh samsung pull a million dollar job uh which back when a million dollars was a lot of money yeah. um because we we're showing grayscale and then literally across the street from us uh, was Gun McLaren, which was this other studio in Sydney. They just did a quick pitch, but they made, instead of grayscale, they made them colored. Mm. And they pulled the million dollar job, which we had already been awarded and we were working on, yeah. to award to them because oh it was colored. And I, that was a valuable lesson. I've even heard, and I can't remember if I saw it online. Oh, I think it was, yeah, I think it was some video online. But it was somebody commenting on the fact that there was time code on it. They're like, no, there's not going to be time code in the real commercial. It's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? So yep. I, I understand the reluctance of the creative director on the agency side to showing it with to the client. But if you wait until the very end to show it to the client, if they have changes, mm-hmm. you're, you're fucked. You're fu- you, yeah. you just burned. Like, you just, yeah. You know. And it's like, I'm sorry that, that you didn't believe in your process enough yep. to show it to them or you couldn't explain your process enough. You know, that, that you know, anyway, so we, we get a lot of that. But, but we're pretty transparent in how we move th- through the process and how we'd like to get approvals. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, so we go through that phase. We go through this design phase. Then we go through an animation phase. And, then, you know, we're constantly checking in throughout the process to That's make good. sure that, that the client's satisfied, you know. so <clears throat> I had that in, um, in New York. I was working with a studio out there. And we had a client. We had an agency in, a, uh, in Paris. And their client was in Belgium. Right. And... 
we were being told by them that, that the client was happy yeah. all the way through. They hadn't shown the client uh, a single thing uh, because they wanted to show a finished piece. Yeah. And well, that's so, what people love, whether it's, a, whether it's a design and animation company pitching or if it's a, if an advertising agency. They're artists and they want to have a... They want to have like they want to be represented. Say they want to be respected as artists. They want that yep. ta-da! Like I solved all your problems. Yep. That and if that ta-da ta-da to you know works, then great. But fifty percent of the time it doesn't, and you yeah. go down in flames. Yeah. Um, this is actually Grimbergen. It's like a Belgian beer, and the whole story behind it was that uh, this, these monks were making it in a church. The church burned down in the 1600s, I think it was. What beer is this? Grimbergen. Oh, never heard. And uh, yeah, me either. And. Uh, so they they rebuilt the church right after it burned down and so their logo their whole premise is this uh fiery phoenix nice so they flew me in because they wouldn't do a phoenix funnily enough i fucking swear by this girl with the dragon tattoo <laughs> I was about to say. no I, I, yeah. I, I put out a I'm, I'm yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna say this officially i put out a tutorial on uh on because it is a spitting fucking image. Really? Yeah. To the point where people all said, like, Alan, a great work. Great work on the girl with yeah. the dragon tattoo. Really? And I had to keep saying I didn't do it. I didn't ah. do it. Yeah. What's it, Grin- What's it called again? Uh, Grimbergen. But I did this, like, big fiery phoenix. And it the stuff I did looked really great. And the thing is, the client came back. They're like, oh, it's too menacing. It's like Balrog from right, Lord right, of the yeah, Rings. Yeah, and, yeah. and they decided, they turned it back to the point where they didn't have fire anymore. They had hyper real, kind of, like, visceral mm. things. And it's just like... this. This fucking story you're trying to tell. Yeah, these it, monks. it has to have fire. Yeah, yeah. and um, but, but yeah, basically they didn't show us the client. The client came back. They're like, we don't want fire. We don't want this. And like that's where all the budget was going. Yeah. And so it's just like y- they fucked us by being like we were protecting the client from right. you, and yeah. then completely detaching and derailing the project. Yeah. And like that's the kind of shit that just does not fly. One other thing that you brought up, which I again I think it's more of it comes of experience, is the interviewing the client. Yeah, because um, I've had those jobs where they come to me like I did. Um, it, I forget what's called. You would probably know this. Um, TV IDs will have like. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're doing this stretching a lot yeah, out here. Yeah. Uh, the, it, basically, there's like a, um, a TV thing in New York every year, beginning of the year. Where oh, they, real screen. I think so. Where they go and they they get funding for all yeah, that yeah. stuff. There's yeah, there's real screen. There's real screen West, and then there's one another one. It's actually in DC. Yeah. It's oh, like, okay. I thought it was in New York, but okay. I think there's two. Yeah. So it's mostly for like reality show stuff. Well, this one was a TNT uh, thing that I okay. Need to yeah, where they have all their upfronts and they show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they came to me and they're like, "Hey, we have like a very limited budget, but we need to do like this big fiery, explosive like logo uh, thing." Is okay. it's what they wanted was something I had not seen done before I was gonna like it's pretty intense and I told him like okay well if you don't have much money then get on the phone with me and we're gonna have the longest chat you've ever, yeah, ever yeah. had before you started the project and I talked for for an hour and a half yeah and I asked them every single question and that's I think leading back to what I said before about the more experience you have the more you can kind of have the playbook to how yeah. a project's gonna go you know what questions to yeah ask, and you yeah. know where it's gonna be like okay we're gonna do yep yeah, and what happens when you run into this problem? Right. It's like, oh, I hadn't thought about this. Like, okay, and then at th- that point, this is going to happen. Do you think it's too cluttered? Do you think that's going to ruin your message? Yeah. And so bit by bit, I fucking grueled them. And I basically spent an hour and a half so that way I can give them first pass fi- as final. Yeah. And so I did. I went through. I fucking drilled them. And then after that, it's like, okay, great. I'm going to go to work now. You're not going to hear from me for two weeks. Yeah. And then I go and do it, and I'm like, this is what you get. Yeah, and I think they, you know, again, like I was saying, you know, artists want that that surprising moment of, yes, you've done it, you've solved all our problems, but unfortunately, it's a process, the, 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 it's a process and you have to get from the client what they want to see. Mm-hmm. And, and the only way to do that, or the best way to do that, is to talk to them and get it out, and uh, get it out of them. You know, we'll even, in a lot of cases, we'll just go and pull some scrap from the internet and show it to them. Because this is a real, Yeah, basically. and just like you yeah. decide, yeah, tell us what, you, you know, because what a great way, show them four different ideas, mm-hmm. and they're like, we hate all this, but this is the one that we're kind of focusing on. Well, you just saved weeks of work yep. of, of us developing these four different ideas. You know, we could we can pull scrap in two or three days, we put it up there, you love that idea, now we're focused on this all idea, so we can put all our time and resources on that one mm-hmm. versus four different ideas. It's kind of like, uh, I'll, I'll go to like a director and say, okay, 
I'm going to show you three examples. One is going to be the minimal. Yeah. It's going to usually be the subtle, re real yeah, one. Yeah. And then I do the one I think that looks really good. And then I do the extreme, like fucking over the top, yeah, yeah. ridiculous one because you want to set a cap. You want them to say, okay, that is too much. And yeah. that way you're like, great. Now we actually have something to gauge. Yeah. The problem with me is that I show them the over top one, they're like, that's it, I yeah. want that. And the, like, problem, Fuck. <laughs> the problem that we get is we show them the over top one, they're like, we want the over the top one, but we want to pay for it with the, uh, yep. with the yep. lower budget That is one. exactly what happens. Yeah. I've come from being an artist and I've always pushed that every artist should learn the business end. And yeah. like, um, I always say you've got to learn your trifecta. You figure out the area you're in and then the three things nearest to you. Yeah. So typically your, let's say, effects, maybe you go learn compositing, maybe you go learn a bit of programming, maybe you learn uh, more what the producer does, whatever it's going to be. But like the more you understand the machine that yeah. you're in, the more you're able to deliver what you're doing and the more you're able to, to talk the talk. Yeah. From there, you expand on that. And I think the more that like a, if an artist was to learn what a producer does, the more they're able to fit in with what they do. If they and, have and, no understanding, then... And the, I was just going to say the same the same thing from a producer. Yeah. If, if the more you know about, you know, uh, uh, the artist's role, the more, the more you know about After Effects too, not only helps you, you know, because, you know, it just helps you communicate with them. Yep. It also helps you understand how long it'll take to do a particular project or something. It also lets you know if somebody's sandbagging it and you're like, come on, dude, I can do that in 15 minutes. So Absolutely. But, you know, I, I was telling you this story at lunch the other day, but, you know, I, we have some new interns that started at, at uh, Blind the other day. And, uh, and they were like, oh, so what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm the, I'm the executive producer. I'm like, great. Like, so what do you do? And so they had no idea really what the executive producer's role was. They had no mm -hmm. idea what the producer's role is. And, and I can't fault them. You know, they're just out of school. And they, but unfortunately, they don't teach them that at school. They mm -hmm. just teach them about, um, they just teach them about their responsibility. So what that does, though, is puts the, you know, the impetus on the, on the, on the artist to learn those roles themselves, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and also to, in learning that you may understand, oh, maybe I, that's a direction, like you said, like if that's a direction I'd like to take myself, or if anything, it just makes you a smarter, more well-rounded person that can get along with everyone a little bit better. You know, if anything, just be empathetic to the, you know, to the, the difficulties of their particular project. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because I think about that too with artists all the time. I'm just like, their jobs are so hard. It's like, okay, ready? Be creative, mm -hmm. you know, and that's tough. You know, I understand that. And so, but if you if you don't understand the the kind of process that they go through, you're not gonna you're not gonna have that empathy for them. And it's the same with a producer. You know, the producer's working on twelve or thirteen jobs, and they can't keep track of them all. You know, you, you of course, you know, you you want to understand, like, oh, I get it. You know, you've got all these projects coming on. Maybe you mixed up two shots. I could understand why that would happen. Um, no, you're absolutely. That's right. the reason I work at one project at a time. Well, yeah. <laughs> most, um, I, there is, especially, I think, in more in commercials, like feature films, there's a bigger structure. Usually you got a lot of coordinators who are like, this is my chance to shine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like small studios, is a lot more nitty gritty. And a lot of times artists are going to see like the producers, the enemy. They're going to say yeah, like, yeah. okay, like they're out to screw me over and they don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. And all this yeah. Kind of shit. The thing is. I'll, I'll approach it from the the producer side. Like, if you're right, if the producer was to learn the artist's job a bit more, I've I've worked with some producers, uh, like Lord of the Rings, a few other shows that like they know they they went and learned a bit of 3D, mm -hmm. and it meant that, and that's why I say like learn the shit you're around because you learn like okay, I need to deliver something a certain way mm. to get a certain result. But also, if someone needs to communicate, you're able to communicate in their For sure, their yeah. um, their Inaculate. speech. So if you're talking to a compositor and you say, hey. Um, you know, you need to screen this element. You need to use this with this mask, whatever. Same thing if the compositor learns 3D, they're able to say, you know what, I need a Z depth, I need this, this, and this. Um, if you go into the render settings, you change this value. Great. Right. Um, the more you're able to kind of understand like where it's all heading. Um, the thing is with a lot of 3D artists, they don't understand a producer. And like, I would experience this when I'm younger. I would, you know, see producer as the enemy. I would. Mm -hmm. be doing my work I'm like fuck the producer is always on my ass or yeah. ass they're always hammering me away like you know and it gets to the point where you're like just trying to get rid of them like leave me the fuck alone yeah, yeah. the thing is if you've ever produced a show it is the most unnerving thing because you're completely detached from this thing that you need to trust that it's going to run right, smoothly right, right. and it, it's the most unnerving thing because if you don't get the confidence from the artist if they're like and I've, I've now I think about it, I've experienced what we were talking about before about like 
yeah, yeah, everything's great. Like, I remember this one producer, I don't like he's a very arrogant guy, but like, I remember him saying to me when I was like 18 years old, it's very unnerving. I hadn't thought about this till now. It's very unnerving how confident you are, Alan. Yeah. And the thing is, I was confident and I was able to deliver, yeah. but you know, at the time, like for him to say that, I'm like, that, that's a dickish thing. Like, you don't trust me or whatever, but like, you got to think about where they're coming from that they they are going to be on your ass unless yeah. you're able to comfort them. It's the same way the client or anything else. If you're able to walk them through your process and explain to them what mm. you're going to do, give them. And when, when you start working as, and this is ties into as a business, if you're able to bring them around to like, okay, if you talk to a client and say, uh, I want this much money up front. I want this much money midway. I want yeah. this much at the end. Uh, I'm going to show you stuff on these dates along the way, and this is what we're going to cover. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, on this shot, we're going to talk about that. If they have a playbook, then they're going to say, okay, great. And so that way, midway through, when they yeah. haven't seen X shot, they're not going to freak out like they haven't shown me anything because they're going to understand on the menu, that's the last course. Yeah, so a lot of the time, when when the producers or coordinators or whatever are checking in, they're just trying to get updates yeah. so they can see where the but, process but is. The artists being insecure to see there's an attack. Yeah, you know, like, well, oh, I mean, you're always on my ass. I, I mean, I was thinking about the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, you know what I mean? Because thing would go from, you know, just like any project, but if things go from one project to the, you know, sorry, from one uh, department to the next department. And so you've got people sitting over in one department waiting for that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, well, how many other responsibilities can I give Department A until this shot is done in Department mm -hmm. B and then switch them around. So there's a lot of it's just information gathering at that same time. So people, artists have a tendency to take that as, as you know, people being, you know, micromanaged or whatever. I think it's just a lot of trying to just get information to make sure that everything kind of gets done at the same time, you know. And if you're as an artist where it actually stop and be like, okay, what can I do to make this actually work? Right. And say, okay, let me tell, and most, at least for me, like, I'd be afraid to say, you know what, this isn't going to be done for two days, expecting them to be like, fuck you. Yeah. And it actually scared me more when a producer was like, okay. Good. Yeah. And this is like, shit, like, am I, am I going to get a stab? Yeah, or it's like, you know? well, it, this, <laughs> this, this particular shot will take you two days. This one will take me half a day. Which one do you want me to do first? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, cool. Well, that'd be great. Because if you could do this one shot A, I can get it on to, you know, to comp. But then if you could just then go back to this one first. So the more you can communicate, yeah. the more everyone's in the loop yeah. and everyone understands. So the producer isn't going to know everything that you do. And yeah. if you were to, you know, and I've had these discussions where, you know, if, if you were to say like, look, this is actually going to take three days to do because of X, Y, Z. Right, right, right. They may or may not accept it, but it's like, look, this is what it's going to do. They're not going to say, that's unacceptable, you're fired. They're going yeah. to say, no, I, I, I bid it this much, why is it taking more? If you say, look, what I'm doing is a much more complicated thing, it's got hair and cloth or whatever yeah, else, right. then yeah. they're going to say, okay, I didn't know that, right. uh, lesson learned for me. I mean, either way. Yeah, and it's going to help them for their next project anyway, yep. too, and then they realize how e easy or how difficult that might be. Same way that if artists bitch about, like, well, we're going to fill out timesheets and all this kind of crap, like, this is bullshit. Um, you would understand that like typically and this isn't the best system but usually producers they will include creatives as much as they can but most of the time bids are going to go out you know exclusively from them so yeah. what they have to work from is going to be on the previous production yeah, yeah that's this, a good point and yeah. you know it, it costs this much money right we try to bring in a lot of the time when we're doing a bid we try to get our creative producers in on the on the initial if anything just to create a schedule right you know so we're bidding it super accurately but yeah the, yeah it, that that helps out a lot yeah there's a lot of stuff going behind on behind the scenes and that's what i'm saying if you learn more about or you were saying if you learn more about each person's responsibility you understand a little bit then you know when when you see a producer or something sitting at their desk and you just think that they're looking on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. They're they're doing actuals for the mm -hmm. week. You know, they're they're taking everyone's time. They they're trying to keep a track on the and they're doing projections based on the current you know money that they've spent so they can stay on budget. Yep. So there's a lot of that information that they're compiling that they've got to have to present that to somebody that's going to either you know tell them that they're doing their job wrong and and you know so it's it's a it's a high it's a really scary job to have as a producer especially because you get the exec producer yeah. who's gonna what a dick <laughs> <laughs> but it is because um and as soon as you understand that like they're essentially flying blind 
Yeah. If you're not doing your job. Yeah, particularly if they, if they don't know what they're doing. So that uh, unfortunately, sometimes that's the, your responsibility to help them understand. I mean, yeah. that's the thing with me for having done this for a little bit of a time. I get a better idea of what it takes to actually do something. I mean, I'm not an artist. I don't know exactly what it takes, but I can I I, I have an understanding. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, so if someone tells me it's something's going to take longer than it actually is, I can I can tell them they're lying. But <laughs> well, going back to what you talked about with artists, you know, being fallible. I mean, I think it applies to everything because like, you, you know, with anything, artists, producers, whatever, you're going to get certain people who are infallible and you're going to get people like, you know what, like I bid this, I bid this out right. I'm in the right. Yeah. You're, you're fucking up because my number said this and you're not only up to my numbers, but same way an artist could say, well, you know, you've assigned them a certain amount of days and they're not delivering. Um, the more you guys, the experience accounts for everything because an artist whose experience is able to say, okay, how long do I have a sign? And if, if it's two days and it's going to take five days, yeah. that is your responsibility to say, well, you know what? Like, that is unfair. Like, I need mm -hmm. this amount of time. Producer is going to do the best job to, to you know, bid everything out. But like, if you don't say that and you agree to that, then you yeah. know, if you don't deliver, then that's on you as well. Yeah, and like, yeah, that's yeah. why I think the more everyone understands the entire machine, the more they are able to protect themselves. Yep. So that way they don't... Because I've, I've had projects where... In the beginning, I'm afraid to talk back to a producer and mm -hmm. say that this was unfair. You fucked me because like you're the one reporting. Right. You I know, mean, you don't have right. to do it in a confrontational manner. No, you're exactly. Just, you're just super transparent and direct, and you just say, yeah. "Listen, you know, I, I know you said this, but it can, it, yeah. it's going to take this long. But however, maybe we can make it up on this particular shot because there's a way to do that without you know." No, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying how it how it is. But let's I mean, wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. But um, but that's the whole point. Is that like if. If you start to realize you, you should all be on the same team, yeah, and you should all learn each other's shit. The more, then you can say, okay, like, I feel like I need more time on this, mm -hmm. or you know what, this shit needs to simulate. Then there's this whole back end process. Yeah, right, right. So there's actually going to be back like downtime. So why don't you shift me on this day to something else? So that way, you know, the, you, the more you guys can problem solve and work together, the more yeah. it's going to have that synergy. Agreed. But again, I think the, the recap is the more you know about each person's position, the better you're going to be able to Absolutely. address their concerns and talk to them, regardless of what it is. You know, yep. for everyone from the PA all the way up to the executive producer. Yeah. And the more you're going to respect them for having such a difficult job as well. Yeah. So uh, I've, I remember I had a guy, Mark Webb, he was a producer in uh, Lord of the Rings, like a lot of different, like a lot of big shows actually. And, you know, he used to produce all Bono stuff. I actually remember how. Uh, this is a valuable lesson for me, was that like, you never say like, yeah, like you get client feedback and you're like, that was a fucking dumb idea. Cause like, I remember he was producing one of Bono's YouTube, uh, YouTube videos and um, yeah, like I remember like the flame artist, like Bono was like, oh, you know, you should try this. And he's like, yeah, I did and it fucking sucked. Well, it, was a d it was a dumb idea. And it's just like, you, you know, there's that disconnect. Producers are going to protect you from the clients and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Um, yeah. But he was someone who could have been become a programmer and decided to become a producer. Mm -hmm. I've never seen this where I was trying to figure out this like Bezier curve, which wasn't animation curve, which was should have been doing what I was doing, wasn't. He pulled out a calculator. I was like, this is 20 years ago. And he's like, pulled out a calculator. He's like, okay, did all his math. He's like, if you put like a key here with this value, it's going to make the Bezier curve do wow. this thing and it did and to this day I'm like how the fuck did you do That's that like, the thing is that, you know you can't just say he's a producer he doesn't know what he's doing yeah. because they, if they've been paying attention they know what you're doing yeah. and vice versa so, and, and just respecting that too yeah learn everything and that way you all can you know get together it's gonna be kumbaya man it's, everyone's holding hands I, it's a machine yeah. and the more you know you understand the better yeah you're just a cog in the wheel uh, at the end of the day, it is, like, yeah. you know, like, anyway, but, but, oh, cog in know, the machine, That's um, what you're just a cog in the machine, but, but it was, uh, it was interesting, like, you know, you having, <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, saying that artist doesn't understand, like, what an EP does, and, like, more, the thing is also that, like, producers and EPs, there's a hundred different variations of what one is, oh, so, yeah, yeah. so the thing is, too, is, like, you, you hear EP, and, like, oh, okay, live action, VFX, and then, like, suddenly it's financing a hundred yeah. different variations. Right. So, I mean, in fact, why don't, if you want to for a second, why don't you just give, like, an overview of, like, the different types of producers that are out there? Because, I mean, oh, there's, I mean, I, I, from production to that's a t I mean, that's almost like a whole episode in itself because, you know, you have... 
I'll supply the rum ne- 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 <sighs> next time. Okay, I'm I'll come back. If, by. if you want to come back next time, yeah, we'll, we'll, I think we'll do have the... to do that. I mean, only just because it was almost. I mean, it's it it is. I mean, there's you know there's line producers, there's live action, you know there's live action producers, there's um, you know visual effects producers, there's you know motion graphics, all that stuff. So. Yeah, I don't know if that's something there's that we want to get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's the whole, yeah, and then there's that whole side of things too, and trying to get the money and all that stuff. Basically, what you should think is the producer's the boss. So listen to the producer, not yeah. the director. Well said, <laughs> well said, Alan. Uh, but it's true too, because you'll see clients who come in and they ask for the world, and unless the producer tells you go do this, you do not listen to the fucking client. Because I've seen yeah. schemey shit like that where everyone leaves a room and then the client comes back oh. in and it's like, hey. Hey, you know yeah. what would be really cool if you yeah. did this? Yeah. And then they look over the shoulder and it's like, yep. oh, you don't want that. You don't want that. <laughs> and they're just trying to get shit for free. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, see, th- people who listen to this podcast are like, this is a horrible industry. What are we doing? I was just about to say, this is the biggest free for all I've ever done in my life. But, I mean, <laughs> we'll be, next, next one when I show up, I'll, I'll actually I'll be on track. I was all over the place. It was the rum, I think. I, I did not know what to expect with, uh, with you just because you and I, we have. I, I consider you a good friend. I also Thanks. consider still our friendship being such a professional relationship. We're able to shoot the shit in such a, a clean manner that um, doing this has been like a quite insightful. Perfect. But Perfect. but it's great. I mean, like um, getting to get a bit of insight into your perspective, especially blind, because blind does amazing work. Yes. And yeah, I'm a big fan of everything you guys do. And you know, essentially, I mean, you're the EP there, so you are running the show. I mean. Yes, Chris, kinda. Uh, I mean, all the guys there are doing phenomenal what they do, but you are kind of the um, the QC, the, the 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 one to make sure shit doesn't get out of control. Yeah. So, yeah. and it does there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I and I seriously, I'd be happy to come back again and, and talk more about uh, other subjects. I, I'd be, this is fun. So, so thanks for having me. Yeah. No, it's been great. Uh, random, but great. But I mean, again, like, <laughs> I I'd love to do a few which are more. All right. Like, let's say. Going onto the production side, going yeah, onto yeah. that specifically, or you know the other ends. But I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, okay. If, if I was to have like one key takeaway from all this, um, artist or producer, I mean, starting out, like, what would you, what kind of insight, if any, would you give them to kind of uh, how to fast track their career, or like what what kind of key takeaways could you give to say? All right. If you're studying in this industry, how can you make the biggest splash in what you do? And maybe this is going to be specifically to being a producer, and that's totally fine. Or an artist. It, I'm, I'm putting you well, on. I, you a, know, on you know, I know right uh, you are. You're totally putting me on the spot. I am. Here's what. Here's what I. Yeah, I figured it out. This is easy, and and this is actually I got this from a from a EP that I used to work with. Is is be buttoned up. Be thorough. You know because. That's it. Regardless if you're an artist, if you're a coordinator, or you're a producer, that you just got to be, you got to, yeah, you got to be buttoned up. Okay, what, what the fuck? Does no, that no. Mean? Okay, oh, shoot. That's all. I got to pull up a chair for that. What does what does that mean? Just making sure that you have all your, you know, your T's crossed, your I's dotted. Make sure that you've thought of all the different scenarios that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. You've got to make sure that you've communicated well to everyone about what's going to happen in the particular process. Um, uh, I was just trying to think, just like, just, just, just making sure. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of goddamn metaphors. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. Like, um, you know, be be clear, transparent, but yeah. like, uh, evoke confidence in what you're doing. And yeah, yeah, for I sure. I mean, what we we're talking about earlier about like when you're doing clients or anyone else, like walk, positioning yourself as the, uh, as the, the expert. expert. Or, yeah, yeah. Like, but also back that up with with real expert stuff. Think things through. You know, mm-hmm. find find problems. And solutions to those problems before those problems even happen. Yeah, you know? if you yeah. can do that, like be thorough. I mean, I've been doing that for a very long time, but like I, I think I've only had that kind of self awareness in the past couple of years. Yeah, and it's tough when you're younger and you're just starting out in the industry, you know. But, but if you you can like think about yeah, okay, well, what are the what are the things we're going to run into? Right, we're going to shoot it all green screen. That's actually a dumb fucking idea because of X, Y, Z or right. whatever it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, taking your time to kind of think through the process is always helpful too, you know. Mm. Like, okay, if this happens and this happens and then A, B, and C and you got to make sure, oh, that, yeah, whoops, we just messed up. But you messed up thinking about it versus actually putting that, yeah. that you know. Be a, be a pessimist. Yeah, well, with to a certain extent. I, I have that with my girlfriend, like, I, I think I mentioned this actually last podcast, but like, 
she will, I mean, she doesn't point it out, but I, I can point it out to myself that most situations, even if I've done really fucking well, I'm like, okay, I could have done these things better, or yeah. I'm always preparing myself for the worst. And it's not that I think like that. It's more I'm, re- I'm prepared. I'm ready for whatever yeah. happens. I'm ready to turn. Like, okay, the fucking worst thing happens. How do I turn that into a good yeah. thing? Well, and that's it's like you were saying. I mean, that's another thing. It's just learning from your, your mistakes, mm-hmm. you know? Like, we were talking about a mutual person we worked with many, many, many lifetimes ago but I, I like the fact that you were able to condone me about like you meet someone who is arrogant and um, very difficult to work with and I'm still able to say okay well certain things I appreciate about the personality yeah. and that makes them successful in what they do is XYZ and um, you know because I, I, I do think like that I don't if someone is able to be successful yet like burn every bridge along the way it's like well what can I learn from this person yeah. that I can take away without burning bridges? Yeah, and for sure. Yeah, and you learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, that's awesome, man. And again, like, very random, but like, uh, <laughs> this has been very insightful too. So, I mean, I uh, appreciate you taking the time out. No problem. It's fun. It's fun. Um, if we were to check out both you and also Blind's work, I mean, where would we go? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's just a, a blind.com, uh, which is, you know, pretty cool URL. Did you have to like acquire that? Like, or? You know, Chris, um, Chris's brother was, is a, uh, is in the computer industry and had him buy the, the URL a long time ago. Okay. And, and so, yeah, we've had people offer like the blind skateboarding company offered to buy it off us and stuff a while back. And we get, we get requests all the time. Uh, and then my website is just tobinkirk.com, uh, which was easier to get because there's not a lot of people named Tobin. Uh, no, it's been great. Thanks so much, man. Um, Dude, thanks for having me. Again, we'll do a bit more of a mainstream one. But, okay. Uh, it was really great to kind of get into the mind of Tobin Kirk. So, yeah. uh, no, it was, it was really great. And um, and don't drink uh, 25-year-old uh, rum before a podcast. i got to order more of this shit. You drink me dry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thanks again, man. It's good to have you. That came out wrong. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> came out wrong again. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. That's right. Yeah, it was a pleasure to have you. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Okay, so that was it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Again, I cannot thank Tobin enough for all the insight he shared. This has been a really amazing episode. Uh, I'd love to have him back to talk specifically about the production um, side of things in film and in commercials, in design. And I think there's a lot that we could get from this. I definitely will structure it a little bit more and maybe keep the cup away from us. But uh, this has been really great. I would love your feedback. If you can do me a favor, A, share this around. Anyone you think that can benefit from it, please. I'd love for this episode to get out there. Um, I'd love to expand the audience and to get more people who can benefit from this to, uh, to get some insight into this. Now, at the same time, I'd love to hear your feedback because I'm going to be targeting a few specific uh, subjects coming up and this is obviously one I'd love for you guys to start to focus a bit more on is the production side. Um, Now, two more things I'm going to mention. Next episode, episode 23, I'm going to be interviewing Eddie Perlberg, who is the lead product manager for 3D Studio Max. In other words, he's the man at Autodesk who is running the whole show as far as I'm concerned. This is a really amazing episode and gives a lot of insight. Whether you use Max, Maya, XSI, Houdini, don't do 3D, it doesn't matter. The insight someone at that level can give uh, into how a product that's ran by the, at least last time I checked, it was like the sixth biggest software company in the world, massive company. Um, I think this is a really priceless episode to get into. So uh, I'd love to hear your insight on that as well as this episode too. Um, I'm definitely looking at just touching base on a few different areas to see what ones really resonate. So I'd love your feedback. And as for me, I'm actually now going to be taking some time to focus on a lot of additional training, stuff that I started touching base on recently. Uh, I'm taking a bit of a break after wrapping from Activision to 
focus on a lot of my goals, the things that I want to work on, and I want to work with you guys on that stuff too. So a couple of things I'm playing around with is doing a couple of live webinars where I can do Q&A, coach you guys. I'm going to be bringing on a few guests to interact with us, which I think will be really fun. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming up. This year for me is going to be an exciting one, and I hope so for you as well. Now, at this point, if you haven't gotten the list, I mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again because this week I'm going to be putting together a lot of really cool content. Uh, I've been aching for my my chance to break off of uh, the work I've been doing elsewhere so that way I can devote a lot of time. In fact, this entire week is going to be to putting together a lot of files and uh, additional stuff you guys can benefit from. So that's all going exclusively to the list. So if you haven't signed up yet, just go to alanmckay.com slash inside. So A-L-L-A-N-M-C-K-A-Y dot com slash inside, inside, one word. And I'm going to be putting out a lot of cool stuff. So more on that later, but for the time being, hope you enjoyed this. More stuff to come soon. Episode 23 will be out next Monday with Eddie Perlberg from Autodesk. And that is a really epic episode. And we kept it for once kind of short. I think we kept it under 50 minutes, which I'm proud of. I'm trying my hardest. So that is it, guys. Leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. And I will be replying to a lot of comments, a lot of email, a lot of messages, a lot of stuff this week. So this is my week off to focus on giving back. And I can't wait. So that's it. Talk to you soon. (laughs) 